All right. Today is uh, Wednesday, May 21st. This is a posted meeting of the Board of Public Works uh, for the purpose of reviewing portions of the comprehensive wastewater management study. We do not have a quorum, so it's not an official meeting, but we're going to proceed with the discussions and the meeting will be recorded by uh, Northampton Community Television. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, so we're here a week later and to talk about, I guess, continue the conversation we were having last week about task nine of the CWMP and the wastewater. Um, I have on my right, Bill Coppathorn, uh, those who may not have met him um, or just met him briefly before. Um, Bill's been involved in this um, probably from, I think, the last task eight where we started getting into alternative analysis, and he was pretty much one of the primary authors of the task nine study and did a lot of the, the legwork on the collection system side. So I think you know, Pam primarily hit the plant, Bill primarily hit the collection system. Um, so I wanted him here today uh, just to be able to uh, help present, uh, I think, some of, the, uh, some of the, the sections here to help answer some of the questions. And certainly going forward, I, I expect those to be heavily involved in you know, the final report and the CIP development and things like that. So uh, best to have him here and hear, every, hear everything firsthand. Um, so this is our agenda that um, I was proposing. Like last week, if there's anything else that we're not covering that is important that uh, you want us to add, certainly now's the time to, to let us know when we can hit that when we can. Um, but we felt, uh, first off, I think there was some things that came up on the treatment plant side that, that Pam and I needed to go back and really research our notes a little bit more that we just didn't have, you know, at the tip of our brains last week that we felt was important enough to uh, spend a few minutes, I think, rehashing some of those questions, um, which, which Pam will be able to do. And, um, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll help, um, help us, you know, kind of end the plant side and then kind of slide over to the collection system side. Um, on the collection system, I wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of um, going back a little bit into task uh, seven and some of the earlier stuff about what were the major drivers as to how some of these projects in the collection system came up. Um, what, what did we consider and what information didn't we have available to us that, you know, that we didn't consider. Um, so I think that's important to lay that, you know, as a reminder to all of us before we get into the individual items. So subsequent to that, then that's what we'll do. We'll walk through the, the 10 collection system items. Um, we'll probably have Bill do that. And I think that'll be pretty similar to last week where we'll probably go through that table um, in the executive summary and maybe just pull up some of the pages from the report along the way. And um, that'll be a very open um, piece of the, the meeting where you know any questions or reservations you guys had, we'll, we can talk about it. And just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what's being recommended and, and knowing what, what's involved. And uh, at the conclusion, just want to talk a little bit about what's ahead of us. I, th I know I covered that a little bit last week in terms of you know, CIP development and report development, et cetera. Um, but certainly just so we're all aware of what, what's ahead. So I guess that's kind of a brief overview of, of what I was hoping to cover. Is there anything else that uh, I guess I didn't bring up that I think is important that people think are important. Okay. Sounds good, Dave. Sounds good. All right. We're particularly happy with Bill's here. Good. Now that, I, now that I remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. So. Yeah. Bill's very happy to uh, get up earlier than me to meet me in Cambridge and then get in a car with me to come over here. So. I didn't know the trains ran that way, so. <laughs> good to explore the team. <laughs> Well, you told me that your your dog woke you up earlier than you intended to, so it, did. it worked out okay anyway. So. Didn't need the alarm clock, so. Um, so, uh, Pam, did you want to uh, review some of these these questions here that kind of the unresolved plan items? I don't have actually have that to pull up, but yeah, it's you know, okay. You, I know you have Let's talk too. about it. Um, the first thing we wanted to um, revisit real quick was the intermediate pumps. We had talked last week about. Um, the capacity of the intermediate pumps and you know that, that was one of our recommendations that that be increased and we had sort of decided as a group that it wouldn't be the highest priority we did want to I, I don't think we pointed out last week and we just want to make it clear that one of the biggest issues with those pumps is that there's no redundancy right now if one of the, if one of the larger pumps were to break um, 
especially during high flows, you wouldn't have redundancy of that of those intermediate pumps. So you would definitely have backup um, and have a problem. So um, if you're you know if you can live with that risk, that's a risk that that you currently have at the treatment plant that we wanted to be clear that you that you had. Um, These are the three flight pumps. Um, yeah. Yeah. The yeah, ones. Yeah. Could could we have a fourth one available to be swapped out? For a replacement of any one of those two, and and yeah. could, could, uh, would that free up one of the three to be rehabilitated? The pump. Well, they're in good. So. I mean, they're being well maintained now, right, Jones? Right. We have uh, flight come out on an annual basis, and they pull them, they check them, and uh, you know if there's uh, issues that they can take care of on site, they do so. And if not, then they take them back down to uh, to Connecticut to rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. But they uh, show very little wear from uh, what they've done so far. Um, part of the problem with upgrading that whole structure is that we are on a massive water table over there. And so to try and make that uh, wet well area there deeper is going to be a major, very costly undertaking to try and drop that down any lower. Um, I know John was telling me that when they put in the, uh, the, the clarifiers and stuff like that, they actually had a point in time where they, they uh, blocked off the, uh, the old Mill River bed and they were pumping it out to keep the water table down. Because um, as soon as you go down several feet, I mean, you're in the water. There's no, no way around it. Um, Having a spare pump on, on site might be a, a good option. Yeah, it would also mean that you'd have to have the equipment to be able to swap them out. Right now, it's a it's a type of a crane truck yeah. that lifts it out because mm -hmm. they're not exactly light. But so they, they yeah. can be rented, though, right? You can you can get a bring in a crane that you need. But in an emergency, I guess the issue is in an emergency situation, you wouldn't have the equipment you would need on site to swap the pumps out, but... Yeah, it would be, it'd be a matter of uh, not only, you know, pulling one out, putting another in, but you'd also have to have uh, an electrician on hand to wire it up, because uh, you probably wouldn't have it already wired up into the panel or anything. Um, yeah, I think the idea of having a spare and shelf is, is typically good practice, um, but for in this situation. For like an emergency situation or peak flow, if you're in peak flow and one goes down and you just don't have the time to respond to it, that's where you want that built-in redundancy. So I think it's it's typical to have that already in place, but certainly it's also typical to have spares available, you know, at least sometimes parts, you know, you parts to rebuild pumps and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think what Pam is, is suggesting is that the nature of that concern is that the, the redundancy is just not there, you know, if and when it's needed. That should be reflected in the document because it really the document really focuses on on peak flows. Yeah. And not having out capacity. So mm -hmm. okay. we may want to just highlight the fact that there are redundancy issues in that area as yep. well. Yeah. Does the document also need to talk about the, the VFDs and how we're looking at doing a bypass on those? I know they had the same issues with the blowers, right? Um the Do blowers the actually have a bypass capacity. With the, the current VFDs, if we get one of those VFDs goes down, the pump is dead. No way, at least on the blowers, if a, if a VFD goes down, we can switch it into bypass. It makes the blower run 100%. We still have the capacity of that blower. With the flight pumps, and we experienced this already, if a VFD goes down, that's it. The pump is just totally inoperable. So there's no current way to bypass that drive element to go to like full speed or whatever? Correct. Okay. Is that a, that's, I don't know, I'm not into the details on this as much, but I, that's, I don't know if that's in our report. But that it is. is. It came is out. It identified? You, we had budgeted actually $150,000 in FY15 to hopefully get the work done, but yeah, yeah. it still should be reflected in the report probably. Okay. okay. Um, so what's the capacity of the, these pumps? The rating capacity? Or? I don't, don't know. Okay. Um, do we know why? I think it's in here. 
There's three pumps and a small jockey pump. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And I think I think together it's 22 with everything in service. Yeah, I think it's like 21 or 22 million gallons. Okay. With all pumps running. Mm -hmm. um, right. And as far as the um, the two options that we looked at, as far as another set of submersible pumps versus the axial board, the axial pump. Um, that depth of submergence was required um, if you increase the capacity to the 35 MGD based on design practices and it was deeper for the submersible pumps, about six feet deeper than for the, for the other ones. So some of that could be alleviated if we determined through measuring the flow that you didn't need as much capacity in that area. Um, so the other, the other um, discussion we had was about the gravity thickeners. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that was posed was could we just raise the, the sides of the, the walls of the two existing gravity thickeners to give us more capacity in those and um, th there are a number of issues with doing that so um, one of them being that <coughs> the, the depth of the blankets if you use those two existing gravity thickeners for your storage it would be too deep and it's deeper than recommended by design manuals and you start having issues with um, things turning septic and whatnot um, there's also no redundancy still if you only have those two tanks so you're not going to get yourself any more flexibility as far as downstream operations or if you needed to take a gravity thickener down so um, we still would not don't recommend we, we looked into it a little bit but wouldn't recommend doing that um, the other the other thing with these um, gravity thickeners was there was a discussion about you know whether you could go with a, another gravity thickener or a sludge storage tank and really in thinking about it uh, the big question is you know what's the what's the big driver of of looking at the gravity thickeners and it seems like it's an issue of what what the driver big driver for us when we were talking about this before was that there's not enough sludge storage on site so it, it was the, so sludge storage was what was driving this analysis um, not necessarily um, not having enough gravity thickeners so what and um, if you're not using your gravity thickeners as a storage device um, container then you have more capacity for um, for you know, more flexibility downstream in treating that sludge and when you treat it um, and thicken it um, and dewater it and whatnot. So, um, you know, ultimately it's really your decision whether you go, you could go either way with the gravity, if the gravity thickener over the sludge storage tank. Um, and you, you would, if you went with the sludge storage tank, you would have greater flexibility downstream in your processing. You would also, um, you know, you would also have some options if you needed to take a gravity thickener offline, because um, looking at your current flows, um, you know, your current loading, I should say, into the gravity thickeners is about five and a half through two, um, pounds per square foot per day, and if you were to take one down, you'd have 11 pounds per day per square foot. And design, you know, they can operate at like up to 14. So you could theoretically op, you know, operate with just one online if you didn't have such a thick blanket in there. Um, and, and then the other question is how often do you need to take gravity thickeners offline? So we know we, you're going to need to do it maybe twice to rehabilitate the two existing ones. But do, they, do you ever other, otherwise, Jim, do you have issues? Well, in years that? past, we used to take them down at least once a year sometimes twice a year because even though you have cutter equipment upstream and stuff like that uh, when rags get cut up and stuff like that all it does is it makes strings and as they swirl through the pipes they reweave so that by the time it gets to the gravity thickener and you look at, at an empty thickener the flights are covered in rags mm. and the more material that hangs on there, <laughs> the more weight you're putting on the entire structure. So, you know, that really has to be uh, taken care of on a, on a periodic basis. Um, I guess I would, su I would suggest that if we're 
if we are upgrading the fine screening in the future, those kind of rags hopefully wouldn't get da get down to that point at least fre as frequently. So the, the frequency of taking down and removing rags would hopefully go down. Um, but uh, certainly that's a, that's a good, a very valid reason why you'd want to take it down and, and, and inspect it at least once a year. Um, so I think we talked last week the fine screens was going to be something that, you know, was more of a second priority and something that we might do in, in conjunction with the biological treatment upgrade, you know, because some of those processes require like a six millimeter screen. So that's not something that we looked at, discussed maybe doing right out of the gate. So, you know, when we talk about CIP and prioritization, you know, maybe we'll we'll have to factor in gravity thickening with fine screening if that's the case. But it seems like uh, I think from our perspective, is you know, and just talking about it internally, it just seemed that the main the main driver was storage, which is I think a more of a frequent headache than than how frequently you'd be taking the gravity thickener down for for maintenance, and that's just kind of a you know more of a typical arrangement is that you wouldn't expect to take a, a GT down that often, and that it's generally a low you know, it's a low horsepower, kind of a low maintenance thing. Um, so I think the benefit or the upside of the sludge storage is a little bit greater and it, and it was slightly co more cost effective than the third one, than the third gravity thickener. But as, as Pam said, ultimately, it's, it's, there's no wrong answer here. and It's more of a preference thing. So if, if having that third redundant GT is, is seen as a really huge benefit and you do get, you will get a kind of a byproduct of that, some additional storage, you know, which, which can't be ignored, that's important, um, you know, then certainly we should go that way, you know. So I think uh, we don't have to decide today, obviously, but, you know, if you guys want to talk about it internally afterwards and, you know, if there's a favorite recommend recommendation, we can certainly swing either way with it. I think if you just describe the issues the way you just described them in the document, we have what we need yeah. really at this point. Right? Okay. And then you well, the other factor, it. though, we talked about was uh, the issue of odor control and whether whether storage mm -hmm. sort of has inherent more order control issues than thickening, just because of the way you mix the material. Either, yeah, and um, either one will need odor mm -hmm. control, and the it, the sludge storage you could design it. If there's capacity in your existing odor control system to handle it, so it wouldn't be an extra. Okay. So since you used this, and now the Coca Cola is online with the plant, what kind of percentage of sludge production are we down? Is it ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent? Um, Does that offset one of these needs because of that reduction? Yeah, we um, we have seen a, a dramatic drop in the uh, amount of sludge. Used to be like in in past years. Um, after a, a regular weekend, not a three day weekend, but a regular weekend, we would see the thickeners actually start to overflow on Monday, and it would force us to dewater extra hours. Now, uh, typically, we are seeing um, the depths in the thickeners be seven and a half, eight feet maybe, instead of 12 come Monday. Um, and so by the end of the week, we're actually down to a, to a level where the thickeners are almost empty. So there's been a, a marked difference since uh, they put that pretreatment system online. So that in place now, what, how does that change any of what we're looking at here as far as solids storage? Well, I think it probably, because the, the basis of design for the sludge storage tank was, was based on you know, design values for the plant. So when you are at the rate of capacity of the plant, okay. this is the expected sludge that you'd be seeing. At the and, and so it's all based on sort of design values. Um, and then it's, and then we, I think we have some tables in that compared to 2010, 2011 data, you know, so certainly rehashing with the, the post code data could change some of the, you know, the, I guess the, the numerics. So, you know, now we're saying if you put that sludge storage tank in, I think you had, what was it, seven days of, or right, like 6.5 days or something Six, like that. 6.2 days. 6.2 days of, of sludge storage with coke, you know, if that production is going way down, then maybe yeah, that more. tank at that size would give you like, eight, nine days, which is probably going to be too much if I don't need that much. So you could either downscale the tank or or maybe that changes things so much that a third gravity thickener would give you enough sludge storage, even though that's not really what they're for, but it, it might it might give you that 
flexibility and that storage. Right, because I don't know when the full design capacity of the plant is going to be met as far as going from 4 well, GD to 8.6, yeah, I mean, whatever it is. Yeah, as you're well aware, we were at one point considering as an option could we derate the capacity of the plant as an option, you know. So clearly we there's a there's an idea floating out there that we don't we don't really think we're going to hit that design rate at, at really anytime soon because the growth just doesn't seem to be there. You know, our collection system recommendations aren't looking at exhaustive uh, expansion of the collection system. So, um, at the same time, though, you know, you, that's what the plant's rated for. So we need to know what okay. we need to be able to handle. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> I, I agree with you, Ned. I think it's probably worth, uh, you know, looking at you know, 2013, 2014 data or something like that down the road and seeing if we can right size that thing a little bit better down mm -hmm. the road. So, mm -hmm. that's probably should be put in there now if it's not in terms of the, you know, contemporarily trying to do this report with this code change at the same time and, you know. I mean, all these things are going to have to be looked at in more detail in the future. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah so once you do design, at, you need to do like yeah, yeah, so updating the floors and loads at that time would make a lot of sense, but I guess at this point, designing at least conceptually for what the, what the capacity of the plant would theoretically be is more appropriate. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, and just before we move on, I just want a couple of things to point out. You, you will have um, a little bit more odor control with a sludge storage tank, but with the third gravity thickener, keep in mind you're also going to have to operate that gravity thickener and you'll have dilution water and you'll have to have recycle flows back. So you'll have pumping costs as well. So the costs will probably, you know, offset each other even out. So there's not necessarily a big savings, the odor control. Um, <coughs> Which brings us to odor control, which was the other um, thing that we talked about. Uh, we got a little more, uh, we read more closely what was being proposed. <laughs> and it's not, it's not a wood, not wood chips. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll be happy to know. We made that up. Yeah. Um, did you end up printing out the? I have a few, yeah. Yeah, so ultimately what, the, the big decision is whether you want to try to have odor control for your primary treatments or your head works or both or if you want and if you want to try to tie them into the rest of the plant um, you know right now the odor control is is down by the sludge area and the primaries are all the way on the other side of the plant and the head works are on the other side of the plant so in order to tie those, there would be capacity to tie those into the existing odor control facility, but you would, but that's not generally how odor control facilities are designed. They're usually built closer to the source of the odor, so that you would have extensive piping through, through the plant to get the air from the primaries to the odor control system at the end of the plant. So the, the system that we that you know that we proposed, obviously, you know, you, you could put something else in, but this particular one is a low-cost alternative. It has an inorganic media inside these um, uh, packaged type plant um, container unit, and it would grow bacteria on it and treat the air that gets pumped through the system. It would be on a, a pad and the pad would um, would fit in the area between the secondary and the primary treatment plants. And you would, you would come in with a crane and you would pick up the unit and put it on the pad behind, behind the, the terrifiers. So that, and you know, you could, the, you know, you, any side, you could treat both the primaries and the headworks, or you could treat just the primaries if you wanted to do that. Um, either option would be available. Uh, so this, so our recommendation would be to have a smaller bio, you know, odor control system at the front end of the plant as opposed to trying to tie it into the, to the back end of the plant. And it's, uh, it's not wood chips. Are there other, um, oh, and then the other big question that came up was about maintenance and access to it. There's, um, really very little maintenance. You don't need to change out the media because it's an inorganic media. It's not going to degrade over time. So it should last the life. The media should last and the bacteria should last as long as the, the you know, the other mechanical parts of the unit. Um, it would, you know, obviously it's a 
there's a fan and things like that, so there would be some checking in on it and maintenance of the fan required or whatnot, but it's not, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be having to go in there and change out media and things like that. So it's a little simpler design that we had imagined. So the issue is do, do we want the report to recommend control for both locations or just one location? That's, that's what's involved in selecting one of the two options. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's fine to carry both at this point. It doesn't mean we're going to do it right. early on or you might phase it or something. Mm -hmm. And you could look at other, you know, beyond this. I mean, this is the one that, you know, we looked at, but you could obviously look at other options. I would probably want to. There's a number of different odor control technologies that can be used. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually familiar with, well, I'm not an expert in any of them, for sure, but I'm not familiar with, with this type of um, sort of biological type of media to odor control. So, you know, so we'll recommend, you know, that you carry planning for odor control for the headworks and the primaries. Yeah. Understanding that when you decide to carry out the project, you need to do a more thorough mm -hmm. technology review at that time. Sure. See what the order, what the, what, what are the orders, gases that we're trying to control, and working with the mm -hmm. right. yeah. And by the time you do it, you know, technologies continue to change, so there might be something sure. different in you. Okay. And, that, and that's kind of what I had on my list. I didn't know if anybody else had any burning questions about the plant that they wanted to address. <laughs> if, if we put it off for budget reasons in <coughs> 10 years, would the consequences be highly significant? You have to talk to your uh, homeowners across the street. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're not complaining too loudly at the moment. But. No, actually, uh, we haven't had a complaint since probably October of last year. October 2013. Yeah, yeah. when I closed the windows. For the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would, I think we would rely <coughs> totally on, on you guys to tell us how big a priority order control is. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you know, these are typical sources that do cause issues at some plants, but some neighbors might be more resilient to it than others. So, you know, it's, it's really, uh, once the CIP is taking shape, you know, we can almost put this anywhere, you know, in terms of priority. So. Well, for, for two, two million dollars, it's worth uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we got it done tomorrow then. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing, um, Pam, which I don't think you mentioned, was last week we talked about the electrical um, section, how I think the narrative just wasn't that detailed about what was involved mm -hmm. in those upgrades. Um, so I looked into that a little bit, and um, basically it's really the, the the primary power can be into the plant, so it's you know it's it's all related to that testing that was done you know last year. So it's the it's the main switchboard, it's the transformer at the plant, it's uh, the three feeders. I think there was three feeders in that study um, going to the sludge building and then two to the control building, and then it was the um, the generator itself, which obviously we have a there's a rental unit out there now, and the existing generator was sort of I guess not mothball, but it just sort of found to be un untrustworthy. So. Um, so really that, I think that electrical infrastructure was just to that level, you know, so once you get past the MCCs and you're looking at the individual power to the individual process equipment and stuff like that, that wasn't included in that piece. So that was uh, just clarification. Um, I've already gone back and sort of updated that part of task nine to really focus on that. And the, the narrative did cite the um, study that, you know, Al Wells had worked on um, and RDK on that portion of the electrical. And so in, in lieu of just citing that study, I, I pulled a little bit of the information from that. So it's now in the body of the report. So it's, you, know, you don't have to like flip through reports to, to get those details. So um, I just wanted to fill that, because that was, I think, another sort of question that, that we yeah. had to answer. So. Um, and that is high priority. Did, so um, right now, there's only, you have the one source power coming into the plant and it um, it's that is it the switch gear and that switch gear 
is the electrician or the electrical engineer does not think it's going it, to, it said it might make it three years, um, but it really needs to be replaced. And um, he said that it takes, you know, two to three years to design and replace it. So it's something that needs to be done. Right, you got to get started on that right now. <clears throat> And it's a single point of failure for the entire plant. Mm -hmm. well, also, I'd like to bring up when they tested the old generator, there were some inconsistencies that came up on the report there that didn't make any sense. Um, like they quoted the uh, antifreeze as being uh, old and spent, and we know it had been changed just about a month before. Um, so, and there were a few other things, and it wasn't run under, um, I don't know, I think they cut the test short too fast because they were afraid of something happening. Mm -hmm. And so, it just some of the numbers just didn't seem to make sense. Uh, so, we are, uh, uh, have scheduled for another load bank to come in and for the thing to be tested. For the uh, generator. Properly, yes, the generator properly tested so that we know exactly what what we have there, and uh, if it is something that that can be, you know, brought back online, then we will do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to make sure, you know, the parameters that exist there, and not just uh, a few uh, thoughts and, and ramblings that we got in that report, because some of the some of the data just didn't didn't. Uh, didn't make sense. Well, I was looking at the generator. That's the generator yeah, the itself, generator. right? Right, but the, the switch gear is still. The switch gear is still an issue, um, and sure. as we found when we broke one of the one of the handles on one of the breakers, it, it took uh, a long time to find a replacement and to find somebody who could actually uh, slide out the unit and replace it and put it back in. Um, I have a feeling that those people who are experienced in that are a dying breed. Jim, those questions that you had, the inconsistencies in the in the study, were those um, raised to RDK or Al's attention? Do you know? They weren't. Okay. So the, it, the issue is that we we want the hire contractor to come in and look at the generator. Yeah. To see if it could be rebuilt. Rehabilitated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and used. For the short term, a sure. couple of years, two or three years, mm -hmm. what were the investments you needed yep. to keep that thing running? Okay. So I think when Jim and John provided some of the information to who's the company? That's FM coming? Generator. FM, FM is coming in. Okay. Some of the data that was presented. Uh, oh, the other ones was kind not of raised. It was, was yeah. So they felt it wasn't complete. Like we, yeah, pulled, yeah. we pulled the plug in the load bank, for example. Yeah. And I think they felt like you needed to do the whole. You needed to run the load bag till the, for a longer period of time to, to better diagnose the issue with the generator. Yeah. I think was what, what Carver had told me. Okay. But anyway, that's the, that's the genesis of these comments. That right, I see. FM generators coming out to take a look at the generator to see if it's something that, you know, it's got very few hours on it, whether we can do something to, to continue to rely on it in the future. Right. And then, you know, that, that might just buy us some time. Right? Mm -hmm. Was it uh, the same size test? Was it 450 kilowatt load bank or something like that? Same load size and four hours and all that stuff? I mean, the parameter of the test is pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, certainly, if you can if you can stop renting the <laughs> backup unit and, and use what you have, I'm sure yeah, you'll save an option. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is there, so at this point, there's nothing you're looking for us to do then on the study that, that was done? Oh. All right. Okay, so so I guess that's on the plant side. Um, I think those are the clarifications we were looking to make. I know that I know that we had left last week with a couple of questions. So um, obviously, there's a little bit of work for us to do. I think in the report to clarify a few of those spots. So we'll we'll make sure that gets done. I, I just had one question on yeah. the axial flow pumps. Yeah. Are, are they just inherently longer, so they would have to be mounted deeper, or was it a capacity question that 
cause the depth to be out faster. You're talking about the, the deeper sump foot on the wet well yeah, for those? Yeah. Well, actually, I think it was the other way around, right? Wasn't the submersible slightly deeper than the than the propellers? So basically, the the depth of submergence requirement is comes from Hydraulic Institute, so which is like you know kind of the standard for designing you know pump systems and, and hydraulics. And what the purpose of that is to avoid is entrainment of air and, and vortexing. So you know you if you have too much flow going through there, you could pull air in, you know, which you're not going to want to do. So um, the two factors that influence that calc is the diameter of the suction line and then also the, the gallons per minute that are going through. And so in, in the case of the axial versus the submersible, the, the diameter of the inlet is a little bit less for the axial pump, so the depth of submergence is less. So that's, that's what's driving that sump depth. And also the size of the well, the pump. yeah, and the reason why you don't you don't need that now is because your pumps are smaller. So the recommendation to go to you know a peak flow of thirty five is a ten thousand gallon per minute pump. Right. So that really drives the need for more submergence. So which therefore is not a need. Say it again, sorry. It, therefore, there is not a need for greater depth. Not in your current configuration. Or for what we're talking about either. Right? Well, I think what would happen is once, as we talked last week, I think what we need to do is get our hands on the actual peak flow. You know, that 35 that we're using for the basis here is is still a theoretical number on the model. Um, so I think it's important for us to really get a handle of that peak flow, and then we can revisit those calculations and see if that submergence step is really necessary or not. So it's you know kind of working a little bit with with paper paper numbers at the at the moment. Does that help? Does that clarify that? Or? It, it does, yeah. okay. surprisingly. <laughs> oh. I don't necessarily have the same conclusion, but yeah, it yeah. has become more clear. Yeah, okay. All right. All right, so uh, collection systems. I just want to spend a couple of minutes, um, I guess, before we, we let Bill loose here. Is um, on the collection system, if, if you recall, you know, we, we use a, a risk based. You know, asset management approach. So um, we try to collect as much information as, as we could, um, and we look at things of how can your pipes and your pump stations fail. And by failure, it's not it's not necessarily a structural failure or a sewer collapse or or something like that. Basically, it's you know this system was designed to perform a certain function, and if it, if it doesn't perform that function, we're calling that a failure. So if it if it backs up, you know, because of it's too small, you know, can't handle the flow that's going into it, you know, that's a capacity failure. If the system is too leaky or has um, illicit connections into it, so there's too much inflow, too much infiltration, that's a different type of a, of a failure. Uh, certainly condition, you know, so if there is concern about it physically collapsing, that is a different type of a failure. So we kind of look at all the different modes or the different ways in which your infrastructure can fail and then we also look at, okay, so what's the probability of that actually occurring, that failure occurring, and if that were to occur, what's the ultimate consequence? So what's gonna happen? So if, uh, you know, so if you have too much II in a certain system, so maybe during peak storms, you know, your, your system surcharges a little bit, but you might still have enough freeboard that you're never really that concerned about an overflow. So, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can allow for that amount of II and the consequence isn't that big of a deal. Um, so, if you, if you remember, we kind of went through that exercise, you know, on the collection system. The thing that I think the key thing that that we don't have in terms of, of information in, in the in the study is really conditioned. So um, some CWMPs, like I think Springfield, we were talking about a long time ago. They're before they even get into this discussion about you know risk and, and prioritization because of that. They're really investing you know millions of dollars to. CCTV almost every pipe, you know, inspect almost every house, you know, really get get the metrics very sound. And they're in a different position than Northampton is because they're under an ACO, they're a CSO, you know, they have a lot of different needs that, that we don't really have here. Um, so we, we never really had that in the scope was to look at, you know, a very exhaustive CCTV program and, and study the condition of things. In cases where we don't have Condition information, sometimes we'll use age of the system as sort of a surrogate for condition. So older pipes are generally assumed to be in worse shape. Um, the way that this CDMP came together, we sort of threw that, 
sort of uh, out the window a little bit because uh, we do have pipes in the system that are, you know, you know, 1800s vintage brick pipes that are still in great shape. So it's it's a little it's a little misleading to just assume age as a surrogate for condition. And that was fine. I had no problem with that because I think the more I get exposed to this over the years, I, I totally agree with that. So. Um, our assessment to get to the point where we are really doesn't have a lot of condition information and we don't have to use age. So really what's driving the, the, the failures and the probabilities and the, the risk in the collection system is infiltration, inflow, and um, the hydraulics. So I think, you know, so, so from those three failure modes, I think it was probably pr pr predominantly it. We did do a very minimal you know, uh, I think we did 250 manhole inspections, um, and you know we have a little bit of uh, you know just sort of um, anecdotal information of the system. But really, from a condition standpoint, there's not a lot in there. I mean, it's interesting because I don't think that we would have a collection system replacement program per se. But if we're looking at reconstructing a street, we would look at the condition of the sewer line in that street to figure out whether we wanted to do it at the time we were working on that street. Right. Just in terms of investment in new sewer lines. Yep. Um, otherwise, the II and hydraulic capacity are, are pretty important drivers for deciding whether you, you need to do something now. Right, right. So I don't feel like the analysis is lacking that much. Um, okay. I'm really, <laughs> con con condition in, um, you know, SSOs and some of the things that that drive environmental impacts, or that's a condition of the pipe, but those would be some conditions that we're aware of because of past failures, not something that you would need from systematic CCTV work. Mm -hmm. So some of the important problem areas um, we're re I would say we're probably reasonably familiar with, and we can account for those. Um, uh, so um, Dave? Yep. Sure. Um, it seems like there was another factor that, that you considered at least in that interceptor that goes down along the Mill River, it's, it's location and mm -hmm. proximity to the river and the risk of failure due to the river. So that's not a, it's not a capacity issue, it's not an inflow issue, it's... So that would be, yeah, the, it's proximity to the river would impact the consequence score of the, of the except, algorithm? Except the river was a method of failure also, right? It was, well, the I think it was the, the, the concern about the retaining wall and, and potentially erosion, yeah. yeah. So that would be a mechanism of failure, yeah. I guess, I guess you might, uh, yeah, no, I guess that's true. And we actually, that wasn't even on our radar at all, and, and Ned brought that to our attention in one of our meetings, that there's concern about that retaining wall, so. But that may be the only location where that's a factor, I mean. To our knowledge, that's, yeah. that's the only that yeah. has been risen so, to us. Anyways. So that's kind of a. A little bit of a special case, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyhow, so that's sort of the backdrop, I guess. So the the projects that kind of came out of it are largely driven by by II and hydraulics. Um, and just one more thing on the hydraulics. So our task five, you know, was to do a fairly detailed um, hydraulic model of the entire system. And the, the data that we used for that came right out of the II study. So we had, we had 10 weeks of metering data in spring of 2011. And we saw actually a pretty decent storm. I think we had over a 24 hour period, like 2.4 inches, if I remember right, which is, you know, you don't see that all, all the time. You know, I've been doing a lot of metering for drainage work. And I'm like, why don't I just get this every time? But, um, so, so I think we got a pretty decent storm for calibrating and, and, and seeing the system under some, some bit of stress. And um, the calibration went pretty well. So I, we, have, we have fairly good confidence in the model. But we, we in our report, um, and Bill will kind of explain this as we get to each item, there are, there are streets and sewer systems that we saw had some hydraulic issues in the model, but we just don't have any real evidence of um, SSOs or even surcharge. So what we what we did, um, you know, Doug and, and the city helped us out quite a bit here. Was we said, well, these areas, the model shows that we may have some potential uh, hydraulic issues, but you know, we don't have SSOs. We don't really have knowledge to validate what the model's saying. And so he actually went out and opened up some manholes during actually during dry weather turned out to be, but just maybe see if there was evidence of past surcharge. So you know, do you see any rags like up on the walls or on the ladders or things like that? So, yeah, and we didn't, I mean, nothing really came out of that to say, yeah, this is definitely a bad spot. So you'll see that there's some items where 
they're on our radar in task nine, but we're not recommending doing anything because we just don't have, you know, that really warm and fuzzy feeling is an issue there. So we just didn't feel comfortable, uh, you know, putting anything out there for that. So that, I mean, I'm kind of stealing your thunder a little bit, Bill, but yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll make it go a little quicker when we get there. <laughs> um, so that, so that's just a little bit of background there. So I mean, I just, I think if we just jumped into it without that, I, you know, pull them. I have a question. Serve the table a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't, doesn't the sewer department have a, a camera? They do. And don't they record? They do. So there should be some data available. Just limited uh, some data. lines. Right, it's just limited data. It's all cataloged yeah. on our server. Yeah. What we have, if you don't have the video, they're VHS format, most of them, if I recall correctly. Yeah, there's tons of those down at the right. treatment plant. And the accompanying reports have all been scanned. Um, Jim, at the, at the beginning of the, I think it was all the first task actually, when we were trying to figure out existing conditions, like what the department does on a regular basis and, and things like that. We did talk about that and um, we actually met with John Hall and you know I was like, okay, so I know you guys have a truck, you know, how many feet a year do you do? And I think he said about 60,000 back at the time, which I don't, I don't know if I haven't, I never actually, I've actually never I looked to verify that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> but um, but but one thing that's come out of that was was there's a um, there's like a national rating system, or there's like actually an industry standard, the PACP standard for when you do those inspections that everybody's using kind of the same language. You call a a crack a crack, you call an offset joint offset joint, you know that kind of stuff. And um, Diane, did you go to that? Yes. Did you guys go to that? I thought Diane and in Springfield, the, the PACP away. training. Okay. Yep. So you can probably speak to this better than I can because I, I, I'm familiar with it. <laughs> and right. I put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> the camera's over there, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we had we had talked with uh, with Jim about um, having actually like the operators who are actually using the camera go to that training, and Jim wanted to actually kind of see what it's all about first before committing all that time, mm -hmm. which is which is fine. So I think I suspect that. You guys will probably have a discussion whether you think there's value to it or not. Certainly, from a geeky engineer standpoint who likes consistent <laughs> data, I would always support having that kind of training. Um, but you have to make your own decision on that, I guess. Um, but that, yeah, so I mean, you would just, I guess the fact that you're dedicating a, a truck and you're spending the labor hours to, to look at it, you might as well have it a usable, reportable, consistent format. You know, kind of makes sense to me. Um, because and then we talked about you know should we start looking at some of these camera tapes and stuff like that and and you know John Hall went to the computer to pull one out and really had a hard time actually finding you know the records so you know we kind of we didn't go very far down that road at looking at existing camera camera work but certainly if if uh, I know you have it you know so if there's a need to look at it it's good that you have it you know so I guess that's <laughs> so yeah you do have a camera truck and and. It's, it's good that you have one. So I guess, um, Bill, why don't I? I want to turn it over to you. I'll I'll shut up for a little bit. Hey, right, could you um, pull up? We have them. Do you have the maps on your computer? Oh yeah. <laughs> pass those, let me pass those around, and I'll pull up the maps. Sure, I can find ones here. Did you the same maps? I think there's the same maps there in the report. So if they're, okay. they're in the back, the appendix, uh, appendix. Five or six, maybe? Uh, so, uh, it says two here. Two? Okay, well. Appendix <laughs> 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 <That makes> two. <laughs> yeah. Under the draft report is the first. Well, we have copies of all of them. All right, uh, all right. I don't know how they're sorted, but. Yeah. Sam, let me know. <laughs> there you go. Can I just. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. 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 Thank as they had mentioned earlier, I basically right. came on this project and started working on the, the, yeah. the yeah. Yeah. collection system side of things. Um, the summary did a nice job of going through most of my points, so I think at this point I can just take questions. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how you guys did for the treatment plant side, uh, but I thought I would just go through each of the scenarios we looked at and kind of detail to some degree um, all the separate alternatives. Go over the drivers again for each individual scenario. 
and then explain how we came to our recommended conclusion. And definitely as I'm going, just feel free to ask questions. Um, I know for some of these, they might have come up, particularly thinking King Street last week, is my understanding. So if, if there's some discussions that need to be expanded on regards to both the plant and collection system there, sure, happy to do that. So, Bill, one of the questions I had a while ago when I first looked at Task 7 mm -hmm. was um, uh, th there's a ranking of, of projects by priority. Mm -hmm. and by risk by risk and in there's a description of, of how all the elements of the risk and how you weight different factors mm -hmm. and I was and so I think maybe our opinion will change as we discuss these but it seemed like we might have ranked them differently than the risk model did mm -hmm. and so I was interested in knowing how how all the factors come together to come up with one number to say that and it, the, the number one's easy, King Street's easy. <laughs> but after that, it gets a little more difficult. And so so how did State Street end up as number two? Okay. And so I'm just interested in seeing so I can, how that, how the weighting of the factors all makes up. I can speak to that at some point, and see if you can jump in more if you need. Um, okay. And we can do it at the end if you want. Or I, I can say a little bit now. Um, okay. I know Task 7 was done before I got involved in looking at the collection system on the evidence. But my understanding was that we, we kind of used all those factors to, to really zero in on which areas we should look at. So we definitely used those priorities to, to focus our investigation on the certain different areas. Mm -hmm. uh, once we started looking into the problems in the specific areas, and I know this came up in some of our earlier meetings, and, and Dave kind of went over it a bit to some degree, once we dug in, we saw, okay, maybe some of these issues aren't really as bad as the risk model showed them to be. Okay. And that kind of adjusted our focus a little bit as we went through task eight and further into task nine here. Um, I don't know if you have anything more to say to that. But uh, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll just back up a little bit, um, maybe like a little bit wider lens. I mean, the whole, the whole asset management approach is, is something that I think you know engineers and, and, and cities and towns are starting to embrace or embracing or have embraced because there's just so much pipe and manholes and, and, and so many priorities that you have to deal with how do you know you know how to how to put one over the other and so it's it's more of a the asset management approach is more of a like a philosophical approach where you, you develop this metric based on probability and consequence of failure and that should hopefully help you plan for future activities. And it's never intended to be a one-shot deal, like in, in an ideal world, and, and I don't think, I don't know a town who's implemented this fully the way you sketch it out on paper, but it's, it's not a, it's not a one-shot deal. So you develop this, this risk rating, so you know like where your, your highest you know, priorities are, and in theory, you're gonna do some capital work, so you're gonna fix those priorities. And then you're going to like enter into your system. So this is no longer a 24-inch pipe, and it's no longer next to the river. Maybe it's now a 30-inch pipe, and it's somewhere else. So that's going to change that scoring. So you're going to revisit that in your asset management system, and then and then reprioritize for you know the next 10 years. I have now this kind of a snapshot. So it's always intended to be sort of a, a cyclical, living, breathing document. So it's so the whole concept of developing this risk prioritization is just kind of a, a foundation for for future management. And whether that actually happens or not, you know, will be more on the city and not so much on, on Kleinfelder to make sure that happens. Um, you know, we've, we took this approach in Framingham um, almost 10 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was very highly embraced and, and they used it. But if I go there now and I ask them, you know, are you guys updating your, you know, your risk scores and are you really using this you know, we had a computer system that we used for th that, at that time. I guarantee you the answer is probably no. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just there's just the investment to actually ma manage that data is really difficult to hold on to. So it's it does work well, I think, for you know the type of plan we're doing um, to keep it living and breathing in, in perpetuity is a little bit difficult. So, but like the treatment plant, we if yeah. we have a limited amount of funds. If, if we have some funds for the collection system, 
where should where should we spend them? Yeah. And um, it sounds like there's there's more consideration. There, there are more considerations to be made than just this risk factor analysis. Yeah. And and so it doesn't mean that we should obviously do number one. Yeah. We, I agree. we might choose to do number three because for other considerations, that's a better place to put our money. Yeah, okay. there's, there's always gonna be this step, you know, this step where we're all talking about it and yeah. we're looking at what the risk spits out and we're looking at what feels right, yeah. and there's always gonna be adjustments, okay. and that's totally fine. That's right. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. Yeah. Hey, with that, I'll just jump into our first project area we looked at, which was on Barrett Street. Um, for those of you who haven't heard us talk about Barrett Street to some degree before, the, the major issue here is that there is a, a siphon that, is it actually called just the Barrett Street Brook, or I'm not sure what the little body of water is, um, that crosses underneath uh, the street towards the, the eastern side. And in any system, it's ideal to not have siphon structures just because there's a certain amount of O&M um, that goes along with them that you just have to make sure they're maintained and adequately cleaned because um, when they're not, issues can occur. Uh, so if you have a nice gravity system that you don't have to worry about it, all the better, but they're always a reality that you, you may need them in the locations and this happened to be one of them. Um, the major driver at this point was there have been some sanitary sewer overflows in the past 10 years, which at this point, uh, my understanding is that they've been reported and DEP hasn't had any significant follow-up requirements because of it. But if in the future this continued to be a major problem area, that may change and, and maybe this becomes a, a big problem on their radar. Um, in addition to that, this was a and again, this will be a kind of a common theme that we'll hear about in a lot of these options, uh, a sewer area that was kind of a high inflow spot. Um, and this was further problematic because the sewer downstream of the siphon on Barrett Street going towards King Street, uh, the slope in that line, for whatever reason, is below the minimum recommended design values by you know, standard design criteria. So as a result, you get, you get slower velocities, um, maybe the tendency to, to back up more so. And that showed in our model that during wet weather conditions, you were getting at least surcharge and under, I think it might have been the 10 year, uh, the, the highest run we looked at, actually getting further sewer overflows. So with that, we have looked at- I just had a question. Carlin Street, do we have any information on the slope there, I, it, it, I guess it's implied that Barrett Street works better than Carlin. But yeah, I looked at uh, Carlin Street, this or Carlin Drive, or how, was there potential just to take the right down there? And, and based on how you see the the drain pipe, is that drain? Or is that sewer there? What was it then? Sure. I don't think there's any drain on this map. No. Um, we, did, we did take a look at, uh, early on an idea of, oh, can we go down Carlin Street? Um, and it, it seemed like it, it wouldn't be feasible compared to the to the other alternatives we looked at. I, at this second, I can't honestly remember what our final conclusion was. Um, but it's certainly something I can back, back check on. I know when we had the CSO on Baird Street, we bypassed pump to Carlin Drive. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any issues on Carlin Drive backing up when we do that. Bypass pumping. Okay. All right, then we definitely can revisit that. There's got to be a simple reason. Yeah. Like the grades don't work. I mean, yeah, otherwise, otherwise, <laughs> other, otherwise, you would have carried it. Would have carried it. It's, <laughs> it's such an obvious solution. Yeah. It, it's got to yeah, be the same. Right. Yeah. You have a sewer at the top that's right at Barrett Street. Maybe it's three feet higher than right. the, the one in Barrett. Exactly. Um, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Carlon is also a new street, isn't it? Yes, it is. 10 years old, 12, 15? Uh, fire station was built, it's probably 15. Okay. We'll make sure we drive home that way. And <laughs> <laughs> I know if you're standing on there, so you look, because the road be. looks up, but obviously the pipe's going down there, so the pipe's going with gravity. Um, I do remember that much about when we were out there at the site. <laughs> 
So our final four uh, alternatives that we carried over from this side, uh, the first one was to increase the slope of the gravity pipe downstream of the siphon. Um, the thought there was, OK, if we get a, a better slope, then we'll have better flows. And maybe these backups don't tend to happen along at the siphon area, no overflows. To really do that properly, though, it's not as simple as saying, OK, we'll, let's put in that two or 300 feet of pipe from the siphon down to King Street, and we'll be all, all set. To get minimum slope uh, for the recommended design guidelines, you actually have to, and if you can pull that down a little further, go all the way down to where it connects at Church Street. Down here. So this kind of initially, yeah. So it's really a King Street problem. It, it really turns into a combined King Street problem, yeah. Um, in that the slope in King Street is adequate. There, there is enough available slope to get a grade that you could meet recommendations for both the line in King Street and in Barrett Street. Right now, the model wasn't showing any issues um, or significant issues on King Street. But in order to make Barrett Street work, you're flattening out King Street's sewer line down through King Church Street. I know this is kind of confusing. Um, I think we're looking. OK, all right. <laughs> so yeah, it becomes a, a much bigger a Barrett Street and a King Street issue if you, if you look at going in that solution. The second alternative we looked at was uh, kind of creating a, a relief sewer almost, just to try to get some of the flow that's going down Barrett Street out of Barrett Street. The thought being lower flows, maybe no problem at the site, and everything just goes nicely. Um, the route we ultimately selected was to continue down, I believe it's Jackson Street to the south, and then cut over to the bike path and connect to the sewer line from the bike path. Some of the factors here are that that's private land, so uh, you know easements would have to be um, obtained. Um, but it, it did provide a solution that, that got some of that flow out of Barrett Street. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming um, we looked at the, the bike path itself and saw that had enough capacity to get yep. that diversion. Okay. Yep, and uh, I'll go over that a, a bit once I, I wanted to summarize these all, and then I'll, I'll go with kind of the modeling results and how we formed our, our decision here. Um, A5, as I was saying earlier, uh, inflow is an issue in, in many of these sub areas that we're still looking at. And part of the solution here was do we just look at you know, an SSES study and try to identify ways that we can reduce inflows into the, the Barrett Street area? And finally, um, was okay, let's just look at that two or three hundred, I can't remember the exact length now, but estimating. Um, it's probably more like five or six hundred feet. Uh, Barrett Street downstream of the sewer, can we just upsize the sewer pipe? And will that provide you know, enough additional capacity downstream that things don't back up into the siphon? Um, so we took all these, and this was one area, based on the SSOs, that we thought was really important to kind of run each alternative through our model. We didn't do this in all the locations, um, just because it, it wasn't necessarily warranted. But this was, this was one spot we really felt this needs to be done. And it actually had some kind of surprising results, because I think just initially we all went into this, when we talked about it, thinking, oh, well, if we increase the slope downstream and, and make everything meet the minimum required recommendation slope, this thing will work nicely and we'll be all, all set, no problems. Obviously, it's a big project, but <laughs> it should work nicely. Uh, the model actually showed otherwise, though. The model showed no improvement if we went with the A3 option in it and enhance the slope on Barrett Street because of that reason I said earlier, that will actually flatten the slope on King Street. So what happens then is now you're really getting a backup from King Street into Barrett Street. It's keeping the flows from rushing out of the sub area as quickly. And there was no change. Um, so obviously it was a pretty substantial project, over $3 million, and our model results showed no benefit. So that was, that was the reason we didn't think that would work out for you, I'm sure you agree. Um, when you ran the model, you ran it under a, a two-year wet, two yeah. wet weather event. A right? two-year wet weather, that, that was yeah. the model run, yeah. So yeah. that was under, these are all under wet weather circumstances. So, Phil, is the issue that, is, is it a siphon capacity issue, or is it a downstream 
back surcharge issue that keeps the siphon from functioning at its capacity? From the, from the model results, it seems to be more of the downstream issue. Um, okay. So that that's why if you if you reduce the flow, it will like that's why say. we're not looking at the siphon itself. Right. Right. The siphon the itself is pretty new, and it was designed with a six-inch siphon with an eight-inch. Um, overflow, right? Yeah. Okay. And the so siphon is that just upstream of the dark blue line? Yeah, there's two manholes right there, directly up by like upstream of that arrow. Nope, no. it's, it's the oh. very top oh, of the blue line right, right there. You can see the stream bed coming oh, from the yeah. north, I guess that's... No, I can't. Yes. Well, there's two lines <laughs> <laughs> where the parcel lines are. So the siphons between those two green manholes? Yeah, on this map it doesn't really show short. very well. Yeah. It's a very short siphon. Yeah. yeah, you might want to label that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the only time we have the CSO is what weather conditions. Yeah. Deluges of rain yeah. is when it happens. Yep. Very heavy flow. Right. So what, what I don't know is, is the II from Hamden Gardens and Coach Light and Pheasant Hill, are they tied into a sanitary system? Or is it further up, opposite of Jackson Street, where we have the swamp up there, which we already did a cured in place pipeline up there years mm -hmm. ago to try to cure that, at least the inf uh, an I. Uh, the infiltration problem mm -hmm, that we mm -hmm. thought we were having, I don't know, 15 years ago. So that's what I don't know is where all the water is coming from. Yeah. yeah, I should take a step back. So it's obviously a combination of both factors. It's a com combination of the water upstream of the siphon. Once it gets to the siphon, the issue becomes the downstream capacity and whether it's actually getting out of the area or not. And that's when the backups seem to be happening based on the model results. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of follow up on what you were just saying, Ned, when we looked at the model results for uh, the relief sewer and removal of inflow, um, both of those showed good results. Where that we we showed in, I forget what I think it was the um, with the relief sewer to the bike path, there was still a small amount of surcharge shown in some of the manholes, but it was well below ground level. Didn't seem like any threat of the, the sewer overflows. Um, and the same thing was basically shown during the, if, if inflow is removed. And I want to say something about the inflow removal. Um, obviously the report is only talking about doing the SSES work now. That's what the cost included there is. So that will just determine what amount of effort really will be needed to do work in the area. Um, in the model run, we, we looked at it a couple ways. One was, okay, if there's no inflow in the air at all, what happens? And no inflow, amazingly, there's no, no problems. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's never going to be the case. You're not going to do a project and suddenly all the inflow's gone. You know, that's, maybe you could do it, but that's uh, going to really drive up the cost of future projects if, if that's the goal. Um, there will always be some degree. Uh, so I want to say we looked at it as well at a, a higher level. I did a couple runs and it still seemed feasible that, that removal of inflow in the area will reduce the issues here. Um, upsize the existing sewer. Uh, it did provide some additional storage downstream, um, but not significantly. And it's also just not good general practice to just upsize the sewer s solely for capacity issues. And you really want to have the right size for the typical velocities. Otherwise, you can get settlement issues. Um, and just general engineering practice is you don't just upsize the pipe segment to provide additional backup storage during high weather events. So with all that, um, our recommended solution was, based on the cost of some of these projects and not seeming to work out, we decided that the best solution for now is just to look at the study for inflow removal and see what efforts can be made in the area to just reduce flows going down Barrett Street. As part of that investigation, that I guess that's where we would try to find, try right to figure out the sources. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm thinking about this. Um, like relief sewer idea, Bill, and you know the way that the model represented inflow. If I remember, if I remember correctly, 
is that we didn't really have any good rhyme or reason as to know specifically where, where it's coming from. Yeah. Like, is all of it coming in one manhole or is it distributed around the sub area? Mm -hmm. And so I think we had it fairly distributed because I think that was just sort of a way to do it. So like, if you run a model with a relief sewer, you know, a good portion of the inflow is being diverted to that sewer. But as, as Ned suggested, maybe if some of the, you know, big offensive, you know, inflow sources are downstream of that relief sewer, right? And that right. relief yeah. option might not actually work right. as well. If everything's <laughs> coming, <laughs> if everything's yeah. coming from Coach Light right here. Right. You know, yeah. And then, no, like Coach Light's hand in the garden. There you go. <laughs> like all the roof leaders are tied. They might just yeah. be pumping groundwater, you know. So. So yeah. So I think. Uh, you know, I think what, you know we did have a couple of look like viable options for the modeling, but I think inflow seems like probably a it follows the best you know the II study you know recommendations. It's, it's followed good practice, and it seems like it just seems like the, the best way to go at this time. So I don't know any questions or anything on that. Yeah, yeah Gary. Is there a parallel storm sewer that follows this? So if you if you discovered that there is this you know, um, cross connection, massive cross connection in that subdivision of that development, that apartment complex. Where would that stormwater go if you could remove it from the sewer system? Um, or does that just require you construct a, a sewer? The parcel bus the Baird Street Brook, as you call it, right. which is that thin parcel there. Right. And that goes to an underground system on, on the CVS and goes right. eventually to Connecticut River. Right. That's they the might be able to divert flows to there. Maybe they already have flows to there. Whose responsibility would it be to do that? Would the city, would it be a betterment thing? Would be, um, how, how would we, how would you go about it? It would be deemed an illicit connection right. at this point yes. and tell them to remove it. Okay, so Whether or not the city does a betterment for them to assist them in it. You know, we already have a betterment for Coach Light Apartments for the pump station down there. Okay. I think that was a 20 year assessment. A that's a, we did. That's um, a difficult problem with inflow, right? Because you just, you call people up and you tell them Get it's it an illicit co connection, you got to get it out. Right. But then when you look at the practical aspects of it, you know, you're like, hmm, it's easy to tell somebody to do something like that. <laughs> but there's no infrastructure for them to connect to or anything else. Exactly what my question is. Right. What, what, where does it go? If it doesn't go into our storm, uh, into our sanitary sewer, where, where does it go? Right. And are we obligated to provide some type of infrastructure for that water to, to be discharged? Right. And, you know, I, I know that the, the, the brook which used to be the Hamden Hampshire Canal, might be a great place to put it. Mm -hmm. It might actually be a benefit to every time. It happens. actually might flow there. I don't, I don't well, recall. I've seen maps of that development from what, 1960 era? Yeah, probably. But what I'm just thinking about, given the history of that, that stream, it was a canal. That means it's flat. So it, it actually, it, it could be a, um, a good place to put more stormwater. Well, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's a bad place, but my hunch is it's a good place. Okay, um, any other thoughts on that? Thanks, and then we'll move on to the big topic, I guess, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> How much big as you want? Yeah. Not as big, so we'll just. Yeah, it's over. Over, see it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> 10 million bucks. You got 10 million. All right, million mo bucks. moving on to State Street. <laughs> um, no, really, I, I guess um, with King Street, I wasn't here for the discussion last week, but my understanding <coughs> is the main question was all right, is it worth doing stuff with plants <coughs> and ignoring King Street? It, or, or do we. Do a combination or post, yeah, not ignore, <laughs> not ignore. <laughs> um, my understanding from Dave was that seemed to be kind of the favorite thought last week. Yeah, when, um, you, when you just look at the dollars to, to upgrade the plant to accept the peak <coughs> versus the dollars here, you know, it's kind of a straightforward decision, but it's worth it's worth talking through. I think. And yeah, so I'll run through the issues, and I guess I don't know how much detail you want me to go through here. So feel free to just interject and tell me to stop whenever you want. Um, King Street uh, is the number one area in the entire city, I believe, for, for inflow issues. Um, and being a populated downtown area, it obviously has. Uh, the number of concerns associated with that. Uh, <coughs> the, the other 
issues we have is that we have a, a cross-country pipeline here, um, which, while it's, you know, compared to many other cross-country lines, which are off in the middle of nowhere, where you don't see, don't think of, don't hear about, you know, this one's still in between two major streets, um, so it, it, it would be harder to forget about. So some of the typical concerns you may have with the cross-country line are you know, maybe a little bit less here. But the, the big concern is, is that the pipeline was originally constructed under um, the Hotel Northampton, right? At one point in time. Yeah, and now, now <laughs> they had a diverted, diversion structure <coughs> um, that directs flow around it. But you still have um, a portion of that pipeline, even if the flow is directed out, um, going under the building. And, and there is a connection there, too. Um, and just having such a massive pipeline in close proximity to to buildings and, and uh, significant populated area kind of raise co some concerns if you're already talking about inflow problems. And, um, so that amongst some of the reasons was the big driver to get King Street investigated. Um, so for this task, we ended up looking at four different possibilities. Uh, one was just to rehabilitate the existing line and, and hope it stands the test of time. I know this was something that was already done in the 70s to the line, um, so kind of following up on what Dave said earlier, we, we don't know the condition of, of things now. Um, maybe the liner is holding up well and the pipe's in great condition and uh, it's not a problem, but it's something that would need to be investigated a little bit further. Um, then we looked at again another SSES study to, to remove inflow in the sub area, whether that would be you know, building to building, look at elimination of illicit detection, uh, illicit, illicit de uh, connections, thank you. Get those words confused today. Uh, or other work, drainage connections. And then the big, the big money projects, uh, looking at just completely redirecting the flow into a new sewer line along King Street or a new sewer line along State Street. And obviously there's a lot of complexities associated with those. You have all these cross, crossing streets that are currently tied into um, the King Street cross country sewer. Uh, the first thing we had to look at for either of those <coughs> possibilities was, are the grades favorable that either could happen? Can, can you connect the line to King Street? Can you connect it to State Street? And going street by street, we determined it, it is possible. You, you can start at the downstream sewer just uh, north of Main Street here and work your way back. And actually better than minimum slopes, you could make the project work along King Street. And we did the same thing going along the red line back up State Street, and that would work as well. Um, some of the other concerns with the State Street line that I know we talked about in earlier meetings was, I think when we initially thought about this, we said, well, King Street's really busy. It's got all this business on it. It's going to be a real disruption if a project were to happen along this road. Uh, maybe State Street's a better solution. It's a, you know, in my mind, not living here, it seemed like a less traveled road for my quick drive. But uh, talking to Ned and Jim, they, they assured me it's not necessarily the case. <laughs> <laughs> And that perhaps you know that would be an even bigger disruption because then you, you have residents who aren't getting there. And as a cut through street, if you have half the street shut down, well, you're you're talking about major issues of trying to pass. Whereas on King Street, you have a nice wide corridor where you could actually shut down a lane with theoretically less less issues to traffic and businesses and residents. Um, so that was part of the reason why I think we favored King Street's solution over State Street from early on in this. Uh, once we kind of costed it out, it, it turned out that the State Street job would actually be longer runs and deeper, much deeper um, construction. Uh, so that, that drove the price up, I think $3 million more than the solution in King Street. Um, ultimately, I guess we decided this would be kind of a multifaceted project if, if it's to be considered in the, in the future or <laughs> uh, now even. Um, we're kind of a combined approach of doing an SSES study to remove inflow, um, 
getting the King Street line into the cross country line into King Street for the access and, and the new pipeline and maybe that would help with the removal of some of uh, the drainage connections along the way. As part of that, we understand that it may be necessary to keep the existing King Street sewer, the cross country sewer, for drainage purposes. Because rather than, once you have the new line, is it then gonna be worth going back and trying to find all these drainage lines, reconnect them to either an existing or a new drainage line, or do we just say, nope, this is now a dedicated drain line. Um, and we did find that you could connect the existing King Street with some, uh, the cross country sewer, sorry, with, uh, I think it was a Merrick Lane. There was a drainage line that was big enough and the slopes were worked that you could connect um, and, and make the drainage work as well. So do your options, the new pipe options, four and five, uh, is it inherent in those options that we keep the old pipe as a drain line? Because you, you're labeling and the way you've prepared the, this figure indicate that you just abandon it and then you don't show the, the piping connection over by Mirror mm -hmm. Lane. And I, I, I guess it would be my reaction that we ought to, these options ought to assume that we keep the cross country line in service for drainage. Yeah, because you, you because it, it's probably the only outlet for the, the improper connections that we already have. Yep, and I, I am, I'm glad you got that because I think that's uh, something I, I noted looking through this quickly yesterday that we updated our report and our thoughts on it, but yeah. didn't carry sure. that over to the figure. Yeah, that's fine. So that will be something we have to address okay. uh, for the final copy. I know here, Phil, you have uh, A5, you have 150 feet of new 48-inch drain line to make that connection. Right. So there is some consideration for that. Yeah, we did factor in the costs. I think we just showed on the figure. Yeah. yeah. The and then, and then change maybe the change the wording from yeah. abandoned to convert to drainage or something. Great. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's yeah. You're fine with that? Yeah. And then you're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Better understand what we're not going to do. Yeah. I think that's important. Right. I mean, wrong. it's a great plan. I, I think it is, you know, and if we had the money, we, we really should do it first. I mean, I, we're, we're a little glib about it, but I think if we had adequate funding, we'd take this one on and reduce large amounts of inflow and then deal with the treatment plant, but I don't think we have that luxury. Yeah, it's one of the biggest problems that we have in our collection system. Right. I think from at least my, since I've been involved in our meetings here, we've always talked about the, the high concerns in this area. So. Um, yeah, it's a big deal. It's just, you know, the uh, discussion about the justification for, uh, for spending $10 million on a new uh, section of collection system versus is it better to spend $10 million on the plan. Those are the things that we were talking about seriously at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. was, you know, how do you get the most benefit from the funding that you, you might have available? Uh, and it makes this seem to drop a little bit lower on the priority list when you look at the long list of things that we talked about last week at the plant need to be done. So. Mm -hmm. And not having infinite resources. Right. Well, clearly a big problem, and probably why it's never been dealt with previously, <laughs> right? I mean, you look at this, and, well, it's a pretty tough one to tackle. Probably why it still exists. Just this project alone is probably a dollar, a dollar per 100 cubic feet rate increase for the next 20 years to cover the debt service on that. And obviously, hopefully, in our tasks moving forward as we compile the CIP and everything, this input will will be able to hopefully provide a plan which can adequately cover all all these concerns. And One thing that I think when we were first talking about this, maybe in task eight, but um, you know, we looked at the stormwater master plan, and there was I know there was some recommendations along King Street for stormwater work too. So at the time. <coughs> you know, stepping outside the, the wastewater side of things, right. was there a potentially like a combo project of just kind of redoing the whole utility corridor together? And I don't know where, I, I have no idea if that was a real need or, or where that you guys stand on that. But I mean, if uh, if ever there was, you know, a, a drainage need there, you know, you can, all, you can think about, should I do the sewer, you know, could I do the sewer at the same time? 
proficiencies you say, or does that make sense? And I'm, I'm assuming the answer is no, but you know, that's... The problem with the stormwater utility is capped at $2 million a year for the first five years. And right. And after that, probably nominal increases. Yeah. And you have other other needs out of I the gate in that. I think there's $500,000 set aside each year for projects. Okay. But well, those are cash projects too. Yeah. Bonding projects. Oh, okay. So... So we'll leave, I guess we'll leave the report as is, but when we get into the CIP and start looking at like affordability and, and things like that, we can talk about prioritization or cutting stuff off. All right. Okay, the, the good progression here was we moved on to State Street and um, in earlier discussions, we kind of spoke about how there was and it, as we've seen in the previous, uh, in the King Street slide, mm -hmm. uh, we, we talked about how there was some degree yeah, of thank you. interconnection to these project areas. Um, the State Street sewer, as it, it exists, came to our attention because the model identified some capacity issues during uh, wet weather conditions. Um, and I know Dave talked about how we, we didn't consider age as kind of a singular factor that played a heavy uh, hand in our, our decision to look at areas. Um, this was an old section of pipe, so we did at least you know acknowledge that that, that is potentially another concern. Um, but again, it wasn't something that kind of weighed heavily and, and made us look into this project area. It was really the capacity issues. Um, so with that, we, we looked at a few solutions to try to address that. Um, one was, okay, are these capacity issues real? And do we have evidence of them? If not, maybe we just maintain it as it exists, kind of continue with typical sewer maintenance. If, you know, as long as things are working fine, why fix them? Um, the second was to upsize the entire road from uh, the intersection, I want to say that's Finn Street. Yep. Um, we drove on that this morning. We did. <laughs> I had to check it out and make sure it was still the same conditions. <laughs> <It wasn't flooding. laughs> um, down towards Center Street and, and make that a larger sewer line to kind of address those capacity issues. And then the final solution was to uh, implement a, we'll call it a, a relief sewer at Finn Street so that if there is a backup or, or the line starts to, um, I think the model was showing that was the area where surcharges were occurring <coughs> right at that intersection. Um, and I think the pipe changes when it comes south on Finn or from south to north. Um, you actually just connect that sewer with an overflow into the existing line that goes to the King Street Cross Country sewer. Uh, that way you're not getting uh, surcharges there that the sewer lines are trying to go down to potentially a, a line that had more available flow. Um, yeah, that was just in there as sort of like a, I guess a cost effective way maybe to, yeah. to maintain a, or manage a capacity issue that may or may not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing with upsizing the sewer, uh, we kind of had to think about, okay, what's going to happen with the King Street Cross Country sewer because maybe these projects interline and we decide, well, State Street was the route to go. Um, so part of that was let's hold off anyways and, and just see where that project goes. Um, but we did look at it in detail and, and came up with the cost for, it, for that work. Um, ultimately, as kind of Dave alluded to, to some of these areas, we didn't have any evidence that um, the capacity issues shown by the model were actually a, a significant concern. And I think there was only a couple segments up towards Finn Street that were showing up in the model. Um, it wasn't you know, as if the whole line was highlighted red and said this is overflowing. It was kind of a, a smaller area of concern. And, and based on that, without further evidence to suggest otherwise, we determined it, it seems like this line is, is working as it exists and that, you know, at this time, just maintain the sewer as it's existing. 
Sorry, I know they wanted to spend. Uh, I know you wanted to spend some more money on it. So lower priority. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Fits into our CIP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the highest priority. It's the kind of project we could do all the time. It's it. The kind of project we could do a lot. Right. We could do right. All the time. Right. Dave and everything. We make it a high priority project. Yes. Nice. I like. Nice. Great. We'll have another meeting off. then. <laughs> All right, so. Too bad we don't have a quorum. We could vote on this. <laughs> Everyone seems in agreement on that one, so let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next area we looked at was uh, I'm calling Market Holly sewer area. Um, again, this was another area that the model identified some issues of capacity concern. Uh, this was also an area where we did have, although uh, I'd say I'd call it minor data, um, we did have some sewer manhole inspection reports that were done as part of the earlier reports that showed corrosion within the, the manhole structures. So that brought about some concerns about H2S um, in this line. There was also, uh, this was also another high inflow location. So basically looked at addressing inflow, the capacity issues, and potential corrosion concerns. Uh, so the first option was uh, we'll rehabilitate the line and the sewer manholes. Uh, the idea there being that you know nice rehabilitated sewer lines will give you more capacity just as the friction factor is reduced and the rehabilitated manhole structures will now have a coating to protect itself from any potential H2S gas and a corrosion potential. The next was to replace the line uh, or upsize the existing sewer. Because uh, I know how much everyone seems to be enjoying these long, big sewer projects. <laughs> Uh, this would start out on Market Street, just south of the work uh, you all just finished on North Street. Uh, we had talked about that earlier, and I think initially when we first started looking at this, considered going further, but then uh, Ned and Jim informed us how the work on North Street was occurring and that no one's going near that for the near future, hopefully. <laughs> so this would, to, to do this though, the sewer line to make all the slopes work uh, would have to run basically from just south of North Street. Um, I, I don't remember the street there. Well, and that was my, it's Walnut Street, Walmart. and we ought to label it because uh, the text talks about it. But okay. Just, uh, and this would go all the way back down to basically the treatment plant. So it would be a very long run, uh, which explains the, the high cost of uh, upsizing that line. Again, you'd have a, a new line with higher capacity, and uh, hopefully that will alleviate those concerns. The next was kind of, I won't call it an uh, out-of-the-box idea, but um, at the new Bradford Pump Street Station, there's these systems that are implemented to try to reduce the corrosive of gases, and one of them is a dioxide system. And the thought here being if you can treat the water at the station, uh, that eliminates the potential down the line to cause corrosion to your manhole structures or any other uh, cast iron or ferrous features along the line. I like to use the word suppress. Not suppress? Not eliminate. Yeah. Eliminate? I don't, <laughs> don't want to be too certain, I guess, about anything, right? <laughs> suppress. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, there were some concerns, I think, about, OK, you're eliminating, or, sorry, suppressing uh, the issues within the collection system, but there's the potential that I think later on the treatment plant, then you get a, a sudden spike of the H2S there instead of in the collection system. So does that have the potential to cause problems at the plant as opposed to problems in the collection system? So ultimately, uh, it, it didn't seem like that was gonna solve most of the problems. It wasn't gonna solve your capacity issue. It wasn't gonna solve, but it would consult, uh, sorry, solve the corrosion. I think you have to look at the um possible sources for corrosion in that line. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that, a lot of the flow in that line, which it, it, it comes from the coke plant. So maybe with the pretreatment, so that could with the be. treatment I think the, the effluent coming out of there is certainly a lot cleaner than it's been mm -hmm. you know, in the previous 
40 years or whatever it's been running down that line. So, um, white pain wrap point coming through, probably a lot less corrosive, um, which is not to say that the existing existing system's been impacted by that through the years, and re rehabilitation is probably a great idea. But concerns about the condition in the future probably are less than they, they might have been had Coke not um, changed the way that they, you know, they treat their waste. I can't remember if that was in their report. I know uh, Dave Michelson had brought that up too yeah. at some point about how maybe once the Coke treatment right. trim plant saw that business. Yeah. Plus there's been a, a huge change in product run type. It's chilled juice lines, right. tea lines. Yeah. Versus before was vitamin water. So if there's a but before they were running what high fructose and high sucrose energy drinks. Yeah. Which I don't know if they produce more H2S. I don't know. Maybe just a change of product lines and eliminated this issue. Also, when they pre-treat it, the uh, um, they're adding chemicals to bring the pH up. So typically, you know, I mean, we go out there every day and we we. Uh, grab a sample from there and we do a grab and do the pH and usually the grab pH has been running somewhere between 7.5 and 8 so the higher pH definitely uh, uh, diminishes the effect of hydrogen sulfide bacteria function. It's a better pH and it's lower organic loading because of the pretreatment mm -hmm. that's what's coming out. So theoretically we, we like to think it will be better. <laughs> I'll double check and make sure that's mentioned. Uh, but do we already have an issue downstream where damage has been done that needs to be rehabilitated because of excessive H2S over the years? I'd say at this point we have a we have a hint of an issue, but okay. we d we haven't done like a, you know like I mentioned, you know exhaustive uh, you know condition assessment of it. If the city has tapes <coughs> of this corridor, then you know I think if if we can get a copy, we'd happy to we'll take a look at it, and that would maybe give us more evidence or less evidence to support this one way or another. Um, I know I haven't asked for that previously, but I think I think we're probably at the right juncture where maybe we should. Um, and if we don't, then maybe that's something on the to-do list, you know, to kind of take a look at this and see what sort of condition these sewers are in. Um, if I recall right, when we were doing some II work back in the early 2000s down there, there were sediment deposits in the bottom of the 24-inch brick line that took up a good quarter of the capacity of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And the system has never been flushed, to mm -hmm. my knowledge, by you know, a professional like New England pipe cleaning or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. To flush all those sediments out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that resolves a capacity issue or not. Well, like I think the model that? assumes that you have having full, yeah, nice clean pipes. Oh, okay. Um, and they're not. What I guess that could say is if, if you don't have nice clean pipes and you're not seeing any issues, maybe that's to some degree makes you feel better about um, some of the existing pipe. Um, but I can't Tell say us that. again what the model says about capacity and how, how big an issue it is. Yeah, it, it was in the northern section along Market Street. Um, and I don't, do we have the, we don't have the model with us? Um, maybe. It showed a, a series of segments off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember, um, mm -hmm. that were showing during, I think it was, it might have been the two year storm events. I don't know. Yeah, okay. I don't with me. Um, they were showing surcharge. I don't think it was showing overflows at that point. Um, it, it was okay. really, yeah, during a two year, it was like two or three individual line segments. So it wasn't like. It wasn't the whole street. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too yeah. bad. Okay. I know Eastern Ave, that stretch of Eastern Ave, that popped up. This, this is going to yeah. fall on the priority list anyway, so yeah. it just, the uh, consequence doesn't sound too severe. Yeah, I think there was a couple on the south end of the city or Market Street in that Eastern Ave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a pretty flat section of the, the pipeline. Uh, that's part of the reason there. Mm. Um, So ultimately, based on the concerns potentially about condition uh, that you kind of alluded to, Ned, that's where we went with looking into rehabilitating some of the line and manholes, mm -hmm. just to keep that in mind. And then, uh, again, removal of inflow in the area to help uh, hopefully address the, any capacity concerns that might be there. I'm going to find a TV that line just to see what it looks like. 
That would be fun. That would be <laughs> fun. And in the ways that we have fun at Public Works. Dave, wasn't that area um, when we did the stormwater memo, looking at the condition of the stormwater, wasn't that an area that had high um, possible cross contamination in the stormwater? Oh, now you're really challenging me, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I possible. Let's see where. Let's keep moving, Dave. Yeah, let's keep moving. <laughs> let's keep moving, Pam. <laughs> um, question. I'm not sure how it would relate exactly to what we have, but I think we can, we can look into that and see if there's any reason to pull that in. I know it's not mentioned on this summary table E5 um, in the, the, the board summary report, but I'll just touch upon it really briefly. We had looked at work on Prospect Street in some of the earlier phases um, and determined it was again similar to State Street where there was some capacity issues showing in the model. Um, that one was, I think, I think John Carver was very adamant that there's no issues there. Um, if I remember the conversation correctly. So during phase eight, we ended up kind of tabling that one um, for now, but I just, just wanted to bring that up because I know not everyone was here at that point. We're okay with that recommendation. <laughs> so I'm gonna find some others that I don't have any dollar values next to. Let's go to those next to make me feel good. That will mix it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next big area, and we already kind of talked about this briefly as being a specialized case to some degree, was the Federal Street line in the Federal Street area. Uh, I call it the Federal Street Cross Country Sewer. I don't know if there's another name for it. Um, <coughs> the significant issue here, as we, we touched upon, was that this is a cross country line right along the Mill River. So if anything were to happen, it has a very high consequence of failure, um, particularly if that wall were to fail there and the whole sewer would be swept away, then you have a very nice uh, yes. river full of sewage. <laughs> I want to show the wall on this plan to show where that, oh, if you like the risk. Okay. Yeah. Because the it's, it's, it's up at the further west, right? It's like right, right, yeah, right, that's right there. That's right there. And what about the other section where down near you here? Yeah. Sorry, it's green. Yeah. <coughs> Is not the river kind of uh, doesn't the gray kind of flatten out a little? Yes. Around there. It's the back there's the there's dam. no wall that I recall down there. There might be stone up against the bank for erosion protection, but there's no formal wall there that I'm aware of. Yeah. But it's really close. It's it is. It looks really close. Part of that path. Yeah. So part of the. Um, initial statement also showed that there were some, again, capacity issues uh, more on the actual Federal Street portion of the line north of the uh, cross-country portion. Um, that we determined after task eight that that wasn't uh, too large of a concern and, and that really left the two options of, of maintaining the sewer out as it was and completing some inflow removal in the with the kind of the sub area. I don't know if it's possible, Bill, to put the these sub areas for inflow concerns on these plans mm -hmm. to, to show the yeah, just to show the area outline. That, yeah, yeah. All right. I think it would be helpful just to see on on the um, on the projects <coughs> that we've identified that that might be a useful part of. The I know, I know we have those already built based on some of the earlier yeah. figures in the earlier sections, yeah. so that should be easy enough yeah. to do. You can throw them on there. <coughs> yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Just so the board knows, I, I believe that line was installed in the late 70s, early 80s, yep. and it's, it's an AC pipe, if I remember correctly. I think it's 30 inch diameter. 30 or 36. 30. It's, it's a bigger it's a big, pipe. It's a big pipe. Yeah. So you're getting a lot of flow through there, which amplifies any issues if something were to happen. Um, unfortunately, maintaining existing sewer somehow is a cost next to it. So uh, the issue there was we decided that in 20 years, I, I think we talked about in some of the past meetings that some work had been done to that retaining wall recently. Um, for planning we purposes. Had, yeah, we had repointed basically. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that 
of recent walks down there, some of the capstones are starting to move out to the river again. Okay. Yeah, so for the planning purposes of maintaining the light as is, we included a cost and we talked to one of our structural guys uh, in the office for full replacement of the wall. So that, that's where that bigger number comes from mm -hmm. because if that's the significant concern. Worst case, you just have to keep making repairs. I'm sorry, worst case, you have to fully replace, but the optimistic case is maybe you can continue to get by with fixes. Right. And we might be able to make a case to uh, FEMA for another grant like we did for River Road replacement, protecting the Williamsburg Interceptor Line, the sewer line out there. There might be an alternate source of funding for that replacement of that retaining wall under hazard mitigation grant. So our feeling was if uh, you know, maintaining and, and as with many of the other areas, looking into the inflow removal, that this could be you know, maintained in place. So any other further concerns with that? Or? All right. Did you um, did you point out that that this same project exists in the stormwater master plan too? I didn't. Okay. So it lives in two places right now. So I don't know. I mean, I think we'll just keep it here because we've identified it as a concern for sewer, but your stormwater has it identified as a concern for probably erosion and things like that. So just so you know, it's it's presently in two parallel reports. Um, so when you get to the point of trying to think about things together, you know, that will become self-evident, I guess. But, you know, there it is. Jim, is it this wall similar to the project we're looking at up by the Musanti Beach? It's actually probably most similar to the River Road retaining wall that we're looking at. It's an old stone <coughs> retaining wall. 400, it's 400 plus feet long. This one? This one. But the is price is similar to River Road, which is about 1,000 feet long. Right. Or right. Musani Beach. 350 feet? Yeah. Musani Beach? Yeah. yeah, it's about the same length. The about the same. Beach. Yes. yes. Okay. So the next project area we looked at um, was a review of Laurel Park. And I guess to go back in time a bit, early phases of the CWMP took a look at different needs areas throughout the city. Um, and try to identify locations where sewer extensions may be necessary or where uh, just general underserved locations. And Laurel Park was one of those, but it wasn't necessarily the highest priority. Um, I think ultimately the decision was, and based on the sustainability plan, sustainable Northampton plan, that the city hopes to kind of keep things as they are to some degree, keep the development where it is and kind of keep the more open spots open and correct me if I'm wrong at any point. Um, so with that ultimately we decided okay the extension is really not necessary in most of these places. However, uh, I think we had earlier meetings Laurel Park was brought up as a big concern due to some um, well first the close proximity of all the buildings out there to each other. They're all run on small septic systems that are, you know, directly abutting each other. So really, that's not proper design. You're, you're probably not getting adequate uh, infiltration into the grounds. Um, and there's been a recent kind of history of pump outs and, and failures at the park. So the city's concern, as we understood it, was that is this going to be a problem at some point that maybe the city has to help with, uh, whether it was through betterments or, or other activities and you got a kind of similar project on Coles Meadow or somewhere nearby. Um, I'm not Marion Street there's Betterman on. Okay. It was, it was just above Laurel Lake. So I recall that this city had a study done uh, quite a while ago on um, community septic systems at Laurel Park. Back when I was on the Board of Health in the, like the 80s, early 90s, that that looked at this issue mm -hmm. to see if there was a way that, that 
systems could be grouped together within the park to it was definitely a board of health document the other thing i don't I think it was excuse me okay, i think it was dufresne henry maybe what i don't recall is how far the zone two for the um Hatfield well source goes up into this area i know further down on north north king street there's definitely in their aquifer for the water supply so I don't know if that's a pressing need with all these septic systems. It, it's in their zone two or not. So the, the issue of this, uh, I wasn't aware of this report. It might make sense to try to track it down mm -hmm. through the Board of Health. We talked to the Board of Health about getting information about failed systems. We had, we had identified this as, a, as an area um, of concern, but uh, we ended up in a call that we had with Kleinfeld that we, we ended up um, moving forward with sort of the do-nothing approach because the projects are extremely expensive and there's no immediate reason why the city should be spending five or four or five six million dollars trying to solve a problem um, in that you know it might be a community system that they would need to look at themselves um, to solve that problem within Laurel Park without the city you know jumping to the head of the class on a, on a four million dollar job to extend the sewer um, so that was one of the reasons we just felt like it was a lower priority at some point it might become um, a, a higher priority, mm -hmm. but we didn't feel like it was our place to make it a high priority, mm -hmm. but clearly acknowledging that we understand that it's a, it's a, an area of the city that um, it might make sense to extend the sewer. Um, I'd be curious to, to see if we could get our hands on that old study, and, although the, certainly the rights have changed for community systems right. and, for sure. and things um, can make it a little bit easier, I think, in some ways for community systems to be looked at. But, uh, I, I, my recollection is it, it, it was difficult to find enough new space to fit everything in because it's so densely developed. But I recall that there was a plan that if, if people got together, they could make it work. Yeah, so based on what Jim was saying, we, we did look at different alternatives for what could be done there. Mm -hmm. We didn't dig into tremendous depth on how all the designs could be done, or well, you know, it's a it's a private entity. yeah exactly right. I so we wanted to at least have an idea and present an idea of what options should it become an issue yeah. are potentially available. Yeah. Uh, and one of them was kind of the community system um, type design, and you know based on their flows, um, I think we determined it was either going to have to be a really really big system or multiple smaller community systems um, and we kind of looked enough into the background to see that they would be legal under current regulations um, the problem is they probably would have to have a designated operator um, based on the size alone um, so they're and I think we did find that they're it looks like there's space but it would be one very tight and we didn't know enough about the soils and what soil information we do have wasn't very positive. So it, it you know, it seemed like it would be a challenge should Morrow Park do something like that. Um, kind of echoing what you, what you saw. It would be 56,000 gallons per day. So it would be a, a small, it almost in a small package plant or something. You know, yeah. that, yeah. that's what you look at for them for its Probably. new system. Yeah. Yeah, would have to be treated and then mm -hmm. with a groundwater just discharge or something. Yep, yeah. right and if we look at extending the municipal sewer, it's it's the blue shaded section and it stops at Marion Street because of grade issues, I assume. Yeah, the the extension um, to in order to get the grade to work, I. Yeah, just to make sure the whole thing's. Um, we had to get yeah all the way to Marion for the great issues. The while while the sewer does go there as it exists, in order to tie in right after Marion, there's a dip, and the dip is low enough that the the gravity sewer would be above ground uh, for a portion of that run. So even if the city wanted to extend its system so they could connect, it's it's still you'd have to dig up a portion of the system. Well, it's still like a three Take million. It three million <laughs> it's like a three million dollar project. Yeah. The only other I mean, alternative. Yeah. The only other alternative might be is tap as a sewer down by District Two office, 
I don't know the elevations of it, but it's all downhill from there. Where is it? District 2 office of Mass DOT. Okay. And I think that's, a, that's the beginning of their system. I don't know if, if it's only three feet shallow or eight feet shallow. I don't know whether or not that might be an option to go the other direction and tie into Hatfield. It's all downhill. That's where it wants to go. The other two options shown in the highlighted and in the, the black there are representing either low, low pressure or traditional pump stations to, to get through that dip area right into the um, existing sewer. Um, so these along with, you know, Ben's suggestion for a possible other s solution could be what happens at Laura Park should they need to do something in the future. But as we already said, this is not something you want to just jump into and take a lead on if there's no reason to. There's no current regulatory driver that's saying, Laurel Park, you need to do this. Um, you should have a regulatory driver that applies to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the important yeah. consideration. We deal with public facilities. Yeah. Will it ever apply? Probably not, maybe? Or who knows? Who knows? It depends. Really, until something happens that makes you need to get involved. Why get involved? Ned, we'll add, we'll add um, a paragraph in there about the Hatfield option. I, I think it's worth at least stating it as an option. Mm -hmm. We won't do much more than just state it, but we'll add it in there. If okay. it makes sense. They include that in the section with the gravity system potentially. Y yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just on the road from Allen Road there where that terminal manhole is. <coughs> big area we looked at the collection system was um, the pump stations that are scattered throughout uh, the city. And all in all, the city takes pretty good advantage of the natural grades and environments and pump stations are pretty limited. So our first stage, uh, the first thing we looked at was just is there still further potential to eliminate any of these systems? Um, and, and based on that review, we, we did think that Atwood Drive's pump station would be the only one that there was potentially the chance of turning that into a gravity system. And is that why this one was separated yeah, out from yeah, the rest? Yeah, okay. so we singled Atwood out and kind of looked at a few more um, alternatives there. And the others just were kind of more generic where we looked at rehab or replacements. And uh, so with that, I'll, I'll talk a little about Atwood first and we can jump into the regular pump station or the remaining pump station issues. Uh, after. Um, so the three options here were to extend the grav or extend gravity sewer to the end of Atwood Drive and connect to the existing system, um, to replace the pump station, or to rehabilitate the existing pump station. Now, in general, most of the pump stations in town, so kind of combining things, I guess, uh, are on the older side. Um, I know there's a lot of signal and uh, alarm potential issues that we've talked about in the past. Um, and, and that would certainly share some of those. Uh, I think backup power is also an issue at many of the pump stations. Um, but you know, the, the most exciting alternative here was, is it possible, I think, exciting at least, was it, was it really possible to do this? So we looked at how it would be possible to eliminate the pump station. And there was adequate slope to get this all the way down Mount Tom Road to just past uh, 91 and tie into the existing system right before, was it levy or? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> one of the levees. Um, and it, it seems like it would work. The problem is obviously it's a, it's a pretty long run and it's a, it's a big expense. So in looking at kind of the 20-year planning period, it just didn't seem to make sense financially to make that investment. Um, when you compare just rehabbing the existing system or replacing even the existing system. Um, 
do we, does anyone in this room know whether or not with the build out of that would drive, are we going to be required to upgrade that pump station to a larger capacity in the future? We did look at that as part of this and we got um, the environmental impact reports, I think, for the developments that we know of at least. Okay. I think that included everything that's going in the there now. The new hotel, the new restaurant. The new hotel, the new restaurant. And all the medical facilities. Yes. So we did look at that and based on those flows, its current rating should be fine. Okay. Yeah, um, David Vlad called us about that. Yeah. And he gave, it, he gave us those details. Yep. Okay. Because yeah, he brought up that concern before we even kind of were, were looking into this in depth. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing we did just to make sure you didn't need to build a bigger station to begin with. Um, that said, the station is um, on the older end. Um, and for all the pump stations in general, I know John brought up how he wasn't a fan of the kind of the can structures. We have the two, uh, the wet well, dry well separated. Um, they're really tight for access. Uh, and hard to work in for, for the uh, maintenance guys. Uh, this is one of them, and you know, based on the age and the conditions, uh, we were recommending to go with the replacement of, of that wood station. It definitely hazardous to work in, especially if you have to remove a motor or a pump out of there. Um, obviously, somebody has to be down inside the the, the wet well, I mean the dry side, yeah. to hook everything up and then they have to sort of squeeze off to the side in case something happens and whatever you're trying to lift out doesn't make it and uh, from a maintenance standpoint it's, it's pretty much uh, you're sort of stuck into a small box and, and trying to trying to work where where it makes things difficult and that's that's exactly what John had said yeah. when we talked in the past. And that kind of transitions right into the other pump stations. I don't want to just jump away from this. But in general, in looking at the, the pump stations, whether the choice was to rehab or replace, um, all the can structures tend to be the older ones, um, which have really started to get towards their intended life already. Uh, so that was where we kind of drew the line between replacement and rehab. Uh, the newer, more the submersible type stations were on the newer end and, and seemed to be more favored in, in talking with John in the past. So we, we thought those stations you could get away with doing the, just the upgrades to the equipment or the, uh, the alarms and signals and, and that type of thing and still have adequate service for the next 20, 25 years of the, of the planning cycle. Whereas on the older can stations, we, we thought that they're already towards the end of their life. Uh, it, it's time to kind of go with the replacement. This is what I also knows. This this pump station does not have a backup power system for it. And that was an issue. It should be done in any. It case. should be done at all our pumps. There's two right. pump stations that don't have backup power right now. What's the other one? William, William Street. Street. Oh. And I know the the prices out here on the. If you're looking back into the, uh, the pump station side, when we look at the unit prices, I think we, we have kind of taken generic from, from previous pump work or pump station work, uh, kind of tried to estimate for, for certain flow ranges what you might expect for whether it's rehab or replacement. And you may notice that the budgetary cost shown here is significantly higher than those unit prices. Um, the reason for that is we also determined that if you, especially if you're replacing the pump station, it's probably time to at least look at the force main and see what the condition there might be at the same time. Uh, so the, the budgetary costs that were carried through include replacement of the entire force main length. So just for the Island Road pump station, it was a pretty small pump station, but we're carrying a big cost for it. And the reason for that is it has a very long force main. So an area where you could you maybe break, break these projects down further is we look at the force main, is the force main fine? Don't worry about the force main for now. Or, you know, maybe the force main's terrible and you do need to jump into all this. We wanted to carry kind of the conservative cost that assumes everything needs to be addressed. But there may be some room where, where those costs go down. But I just don't want those to be a shocker when you know, look at them in detail. But that's the reason for it. 
So uh, what, what I'm reading under page 62, uh, uh, life cycle cost analysis, it says pump stations require continual power. So does that mean that the $400,000 we carry for the pump station includes backup power? The, the, we looked at an annual budget cost for the continual power. Yeah. So that was factored in. Um, into the total life cycle costs. So that would be, I think, the uh, we had annual budget numbers, depending on the size of $10,000, $30,000 for power and potential maintenance. Um, You're asking well, about I'm the asking generator. About the, the I'm generator. asking about the capital cost. Oh, the capital cost. On page 62, there's a table, and it says, the first line is replace that with pump station, and it's a cost of $400,000. In the paragraph right below that table, it says pump stations require continual power. So presumably, if there's a, a generator in that $400,000. Um, Dave, what do you think? <laughs> Good one. No, I think this was um, probably just the pump station itself, I believe. Yeah, I mean, we kind of. At this stage of the game, you know, we're so far away from knowing what kind of pump station, you know, what or the specific elements, et cetera. So we kind of have a pretty, uh, pretty low resolution range of costs for these kinds of things. But you do have a thirty percent contingency. So we I do, can, yeah. I can, I can imagine a I, I generator fitting into that. I one. suspect it would. Yeah. And I know Dave had more involvement in kind of talking about the unit you know, costs here um, with Cecilia, who's not with us today, but. Uh, I know we kind of tried to find a range that was conservative enough that we hoped we'd be able to catch some of these things. And like you said, with the contingency, you know, we imagine that would. Mm -hmm. So that uh, covers the main points I wanted to hit on the pump stations. Do you want to do you want to walk through each individual? Each one? One? I mean, not okay. not much detail, but just what the recommendation is. Yeah, sure. Know, if there's general agreement to that, I know you said blanketly we, we kind of said the can stations we wanted to replace the submersible ones. Yeah. Maybe just rehab, but I mean. Uh, I definitely want to fish pump on because I know you guys will be probably interested why it's even on the list. The um, real low priority one. <laughs> the real low priority one. All right. <laughs> so Bradford Street obviously is shown in there. Uh, with a cost for work, and it's it's a big cost, I know. Um, when we were looking at pump stations, we kind of considered, um, and this was after kind of discussion with multiple people, that typical life for the pump station, you should expect 25 years before you have to start looking, what was 25? What, 20? Yeah. 25? Nominally 25. Yeah. Um, before you really need to start thinking about upgrades, but total life ends up being about 50 years. So we, we did a little bit of a, the pump station review kind of was drawn out a little further than the, 20, the typical 20 year planning mm -hmm. period that the CWP was really covering. It almost looks at 50 years um, based on those design lives. So within, 25 years from now, we expect there may be some work that's needed at the Bradford Street pump station. Uh, right now, I'm sure you're all hoping nothing is, uh, is soon. <laughs> I know our chairman would like to spend more money on the station. <laughs> he uh, might be out of a job, but <laughs> he'd love it. So, so the cost there is assuming 25 years or so, maybe further. You may need to do some upgrades there to equipment just as technology advances and, and other things increase. And given the size of the pump station, we looked at rehab costs just proportionally being higher. Um, and hopefully with how it was designed and built, uh, there will be no problems there for a long time to come. But we, we didn't want to just completely put it aside and, and forget about it. Um, Burt's, Burt's Pit Road pump station, we're recommending replacement. Um, it's about a, you know, in the 200 gallon per minute range, so it's a smaller station. Um, it's about, again, I think a can structure uh, on, the old, on the older side. I think all these cans were put in maybe 60s? 60s and 70s. 70s. Yeah. I think 77 according to the 77. 
Let me pull that, that one up here. I'll pull that table up for reference. Looks like, according to this table, the oldest one is that would drive in 1967. Okay. Yeah, the two submersibles were late 80s. Page 66. Thank you. <clears throat> so Island Road was a another 200, 280 gallon per minute. Um, we left it out. <laughs> No, I just somehow jumped through there. Okay. And so there's another flooded suction can structure, um, 1978, that we cited rehab, fire sorry, replacement for. Um, and that had one of the, as I mentioned before, long law enforcement, nearly a mile, 4,400 feet, give or take. Uh, the leachate station, just a smaller station. It's got the more up-to-date submersible style, so it seems like rehabilitation will be adequate there. While we're on that, is do we perceive we need that I indefinitely? Hope I hope. You hope not. Are there any facilities in the storage building? No toilet facilities. No, they disconnected all no. that. Okay. We're hoping that uh, eventually we won't need that pump station. Okay. And so hopefully they need well, to be eliminate it will come before the need to do spend money on it. <laughs> we want to monitor the reduction in those leachate flows and yeah. eventually we might uh, we might just go to a tight tank type of thing mm -hmm. depending on what the flows are because we have that it's the pump station and the cost to run it and maintaining the force vein and, and the whole deal that takes a lot of time and money to do. So eventually, sooner than later, we'd like to mothball it if the flows, if we see reduction in flows that allow us to do that. Sure. So with that, would you want us to give a, just a, throw a paragraph in or something describing that potential in the future? Or um, leave it as it is for now? I think it would be helpful. Sure. Just the lamppost cap. Sure, just to remind, yep. to remind people that the lamppost cap when we say reduction in change flows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have a uh, brick drive pump station. It's another smaller station, um, 120 gallons per minute. Uh, not too long of a force main, 640 feet. Um, but the older, older can style again. And lastly, the William Street pump station, which uh, Ned mentioned, you know, has the need for backup power still. Uh, so that would be part of the recommended real rehabilitation costs. Um, and that covers all pump stations. <laughs> Any further thoughts on that or questions? No thoughts. I mean, just when we do the, the CIP, obviously prioritizing a replacement schedule for which ones in which year would mm -hmm. be something that we need to wrestle with. Um, much in the worst condition. Okay. What would the general approach be? I know during this review, I since we kind of broke out Atwood, we took a lot of time looking at the site reports there. But did we have reports for all the other stations too? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't dig into those uh, nearly as much. So, yeah, no, that's we, we do have some information we can scan through and then talk to you as needed. Yeah, for the last meeting, Kevin and I had, Kevin and Dave and I had a little discussion on prioritizing uh, things in the CIP in a, in a way that would be broken down into something that would be useful for us. Um, so the breakdown will be a little bit different than the scenarios that are in task nine. But, and this would fall on the same lines. They're all grouped together understandably in task nine, but when we look at the CIP, then um, you know, having those broken down in a way that's a little bit more refined would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing I'll mention, I guess, uh, if there's no further pump station questions, 
as we keep carrying it through just to make sure that there it's not forgotten about um, but there was uh, the industrial park interceptors there was the study and recommended work done previously for those um, I honestly don't know much about that project I don't know you, have you, need, uh, you need Alan Neal to okay. the details. <laughs> but we get a low cost proposal from Al for construction services and we're happy to Okay. <laughs> we'll be talking shortly about it. But, uh, we're hoping to build it this summer. Okay. So by the time this is done, it will be we hope addressed. We hope so. We, we've got the money to build it and the design is pretty much done. We have some local permitting and commission to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then just get it. That was obviously a pretty huge priority in the capacity. All right. Pass that on. Then. Yeah. Uh, so that really covers uh, the collection system portion. Sorry, I don't have enough to talk about that. It makes you come back again next week. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not as exciting as the treatment plant. Pam, Pam did a good job for that, I guess. So. Uh, any other questions or comments just in general? Or? You drop the same music in here at I know. I just get to lean back and relax. And yeah. Yeah. 45 minutes of spare. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, I just had one question on that. Replacing the flight pump with axial flows, which are supposedly more efficient. Mm -hmm. how, how much? <laughs> what, what dollars are, might be involved there in terms of the savings? In, in terms, terms of the life cycle? Um, well, for, I was thinking of today's what this would cost primarily. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What if they have the horsepower? I think jump to that section to be honest with you. Jim Dostal always used to do the thing in the board meetings mm -hmm. with questions about pump efficiencies and things and the size and everything. It'd be like. <laughs> Don't ask me that. Sure. Yeah. I have it all memorized. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Plus, I anticipated your question. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
19,000 for okay. so, the same. Take that to the bank, can't you? <laughs> 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 a couple hundred years, you could pay for the pump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be Once. Supply coffee for the meetings. <laughs> I, mean, I think if I remember right from last week, you kind of said that these costs were kind of close enough that we could keep both technologies on the table, I think, so. Um, so I think the only thing I want, the only other thing, and we don't, I mean, doesn't need to take much time, but I mean, I guess next steps, you know, kind of what are we, what are we, what are we doing next year? Um, obviously we have task eight, we've never formally finalized. I think I have still a draft version, but I, I don't think there was a lot of work to do. So I could like to maybe package task eight and nine together and, and call it maybe done with some of with the input we got over the past two meetings. What's task eight? It's kind of like the consumer report screening version of this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Too far. <laughs> is it too far in the in the rearview mirror at this point, right? Um, we got to be done with that because we're done with task one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We haven't. Um, I I have not sent task eight or nine to GDP at this point, and I think I probably owe them a uh, just a little update, I guess, mm -hmm. just to keep them in the loop. Uh, Didi's not on the job anymore, right? That's correct. Okay. I remember an email a while ago that we have a new contact there for this project, so we'll, we'll get that over to them. So we'll probably, so we'll package eight and nine together for you guys final, and then once you have a chance to look at it, we'll get it off to DEP as well. Um, but I presume we can probably continue into the next couple of phases. Um, task 10, I think we talked about last week, was kind of an environmental assessment of some of these capital projects. Um, I don't expect it's going to be a lot. We'll look at the MEPA triggers, you know, we'll look at proximity to light wetlands, environmental resources, stuff like that. Um, but predominantly the majority of the work is on the plant. So, um, and I don't think we're going to divert the old Millbrook River at this point. <laughs> I'll stay away from that if we can. Um, and then the CIP, so if I, I don't know, I guess it would be good to have your feedback or your input right now on, on what would be most useful on a CIP? I know I have a I have a contract that has a certain scope in it, you know, and, and you know I'll follow that. But I just want to know what what is most important. And Jim started to give us a little bit of feedback last week on that, but might as well open it up for the whole group. So I think that would be good use of the next you know ten minutes or whatever before we conclude. So what it, what I was telling them after the meeting last week was that um, it was along the lines of the the comments that we had about the scenarios and the projects that were described in task nine, and that was that some of these projects have to be, some of the scenarios have to be deconstructed and then prioritized and then looked at in smaller pieces in terms of um, how you might combine them or, or disengage them for a multi-year capital improvement plan um, in, in trying to put those things together in a way that makes sense because if we don't do it now, we're gonna be left needing to do it. So I felt like the, lo the, the sooner we could get Sort of a, re a, rea a sort of a reality check on what we think the projects might actually be, and get that in the CIP. The more useful this document is going to be for us. Um, so I don't know, you know, some of the feedback and notes that we gave in the last meeting probably was helpful in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that was my general thought. Was I would like to get the CIP as close to something that we might implement um, as possible, realizing that every project in and of itself would still need to be reviewed by us. We may still need to do additional research and, and data collection to identify whether we would actually move on a project. But in terms of getting all the projects together, we'd like to sort of start getting the groupings right for them. I don't know what other people's thoughts are on it. So do we need to provide them guidance on the magnitude of the cost for these groups of projects? Or I, I'm not quite sure how, as a consultant, you look at this whole basket. Right. Because we, my notes say we probably got 15 million dollars of high priority projects. Right. <coughs> so what we talked about last week after the meeting was um, sort of a, <coughs> a prioritized list, but not necessarily assigned to a year. Mm -hmm. In that what we decide to do and the board decides to do in any, any given year would be based on us taking the top two projects or three projects or four projects and, the run, and then doing a financial analysis for the impact on the rates 
in combination with what other things we have on the water side or the stormwater side so that we can we can run scenarios for the board to determine what they think is affordable in terms of rate increases um, because really plant builder would have no way of knowing what we could you know what would a 20-year plan be um, in terms of breaking these projects up into 20 years because we don't know if we can even afford all the projects in 20 years so my thought was more what we think how the projects might be grouped from them from um, from the best standpoint like at the plant in terms of uh, things that need to be done now, and, but come up with this overall prioritized list without assigning a year, and then we would pick projects from that and look at affordability, and then develop our own internal capital improvement plan in conjunction with the other utility uh, projects that we have. So they'd be pricing the projects along the, the lines of the way they're already broken apart? Well, some of the scenarios. Yeah, we can we can detail that more, break them up a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think because we talked about that last week on the plan, especially there was a few cases where we could easily do that, and it would allow you to shuffle things around or or reprioritize. I think the devil's going to be in the details on this one, is it? Right. I mean, I'd like to get a little bit closer than what we have, because I can already see mm -hmm. the difficulties in, in in trying to parse the information out. You know, for us. To do it, if, if I can't, I feel like I need client builder cell to get mm -hmm. a better, more detailed CIP, because otherwise I'll be left with this, which is great information. But then I'm going to need to break it down, and having their expertise and Jim's, you know, information about the plant and those things, really all need to be combined to get us a little bit closer to what um, what the actual plan might be. So I think we need to take the benefit of their expertise at this point to try to do. Well, that. I I agree with that. I'm I'm just. Wondering if we'll, we'll still have a high priority solid dewatering project and a high priority high flow project. And it, it'd still be broken in, into those kinds of pieces as opposed to project one, project two, and project three. I mean, which may be pieces from a bunch of these. Right. You know, I don't. Right. Because so there are pieces, there were pieces we were seeing from the last meeting. From different scenarios like mm -hmm. the headworks and the gravity thickening, or whatever you were talking about that today, right? There might be some of these different areas of the plant that you might want to do in conjunction with another, one another, but in the scenarios they're not because you went from the headworks to the primary to the secondary disinfection, that sort of thing. And then you talk about, you know, we had chlorination and I don't know, it was just so many different things, um, and some of them you know, we would like to have done immediately and figuring out what, what could actually be affordable. There are quite a number of things that we said, oh yeah, boy, we're going to do that. You need to do that right now, but if you take you three or four, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you take four or five of those and all of a sudden you're 10 million bucks. That's right. You know, we're not going to do that in year one. Um, so uh, I guess to me, trying to break them up into smaller bits and then figuring out how we might be able to combine them or afford them. That's where I was headed. Small, small, small bits. Small bits that we don't ask them to try to group. We won't group. But we'll take them apart. You guys can group them. I think it would be good to make sure that you know which projects really should be connected, though, too. Because I know, like, with the fine screen, was one of them that might be in a completely different area of the plant that's going to affect the equipment further down in the process. Yeah. You don't want to go replacing the equi that equipment and then have the fine screen not in place to catch some of the stuff that would not, like, right. it would hurt the life of the, the mm -hmm. equipment. So it'd be good to at least have an asterisk saying, well, if we do this, we really should include this on the this this project. Yeah, potential linkages, right, between mm -hmm. the, exactly. the stuff and how they could be combined mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, the small, you know, it's like the smaller thing. I get three dollars in my pocket. Can I get a coffee and a donut today, or can I just get a large <laughs> coffee and a half a donut, or a small coffee and two donuts? <laughs> Figure it out. I no coffee and a dozen donuts. So. Yeah. Glass of water. Water. I get three cents. I water and save water. three dollars for the bigger project. Um, a question, I guess a, a kind of a, a question as part of prioritization, is it fair for us to assume 
prioritizing products of the plant in such a way that we're we're assuming no work being done on inflow in the collection system, even though it, in reality, you know, I, I'm assuming we are going to go ahead with some SSCS work and potentially some inflow removal work. But I mean, I don't necessarily want to, you know, guess a number of how long it's going to take to do SSCS work and inflow removal because we just don't know what what's going to come out of the SSCS. You know what I mean? So, I just. I can. I guess maybe we can put that out there as like oh, an right. assumption up front that says, you know, the priority for work at the plant is done kind of with the knowledge or with the assumption that there's no inflow reduction as of today. I mean, I if I tr if I try to like tie those together, I think it will get too. I think the schedule will get drawn out, and there'll be too many unknowns. I think as to when you could actually get in there and start doing some things. Is that fair? Well, I think. Some of the SSCS work is recommended to be done. Mm -hmm. it, it, we were talking about some of it today. Um, those are relatively low cost items that we would probably, I, I would think we would move on some of that because there are benefits not only to the collection system but benefits to the plant. Yeah. But then the other thing we talked about was just trying to come up with a flow metering program to try to yeah right try to, try to nail that thirty five million. I mean that's not a capital, that's not even a capital improvement plan type of thing. It's more. Um, of an addendum to the CWRP, which is mm -hmm. looking at more meeting, trying to refine what the peak number is, mm -hmm. peak flow, but that may be more of a detail uh, than anything. I guess the SSCS, I, I could with some confidence lay out like an SES schedule, but what I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in is is mm -hmm. what's going to come out of that and how long it's going to take to tackle the, what comes out of that. Right. Particularly with inflow because, you know, inflow takes, it takes political will and, and, and somebody who's really committed to it and, you know, willing to, you know, not play nice with the, with the residents to some degree and stuff like that. So it's... Well, never worked for us. We always play nice. <laughs> <laughs> it it uh, seems to me that the high priority projects have to be completely independent of inflow removal, that, yeah. that we need to advance those and there's no chance that we'll do any inflow removal before those are implemented. Yeah. So yeah. I think okay. then those are based on yeah. The, the the model. Okay. I'd and like to make maybe that yeah. into the program. No, we'll, I think we'll I, have the benefit of inflow reduction, but right. not at the beginning. Right. And that number might be, you know, ultimately you'll need to decide what that peak flow is going to be, and that goes a little bit hand in hand. We don't really know what the inflow reduction would be until it gets done. Right. I I think doing that metering addendum you were talking about, I think that would get us at least feel a little bit better about the 35 anyways or, or something other than 35. Yeah, we need to do that. A number of these high priority projects aren't related to flow anyway. So. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Okay. No, that, that helps. I think that would untie some potential knots there for prioritizing things. Um, all right. No, I think that as far as the collection system, is there more higher priority on the pump station work than some of the gravity system work, I realized Bear Street, you really, your hands are tied until you know whether or not you can take care of the II issue and mm -hmm. how do you lay a, a five or ten year capital plan without knowing what has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, you, have, you know the pump stations are kind of at their end of their useful they're, life. They're, there's a concrete idea of right. what's going on. Yeah, and you I, need them. I mean, I think with the pump stations, certainly I'll have to go back to my notes to see if I can come up with a prioritization within them themselves, but I think it's one of those things where it's a good idea to just sort of, you know, plan to do one over like a period, you know, like one every two years or something like that, whatever seems like a reasonable implementation schedule in terms of what your other costs are and stuff like that. But um, I think it's just kind of at that time where we should just be kind of cycling them out. Yeah, I mean, if you can prioritize the pump stations within themselves, then we can figure out what year we yeah. can do them and right. combine them with other projects that yeah. we can afford. I don't see any collection work. Sorry, no. <laughs> nice job. Yeah. Yeah. The other issue on pump stations are the two without standby power. Does, I mean, you can do standby power separately from mm -hmm. the rest of the upgrade. So we meet next week to review this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just to get the other coffee and donuts. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be hungry by next week. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, i got 20 minutes left over, so I mean, I'm happy to continue talking, but if we think we're done, then I, I think we can wrap up. Mm, pretty good. Good. Okay.
We should talk about the schedule at some point. I guess you won't be ready <coughs> to meet next week, but yep. ultimately we should revisit. I know we've held, we've held up things quite a bit on our side, but we should. Well, I think we've had, it, well, I've had my own share of holding things up too, so mm -hmm. I, mean, I think, uh, yeah, schedule is something that, that always is, tends to leak for a while. So. Yeah, so try to figure out what the, yeah. what the end game is going to be here for the remaining tasks and getting getting everything wrapped up. And well, how about, like, what makes sense for the next time this group gets together? Like, what, what juncture of the next phase would it be once we kind of have our priority, you know, recommendations, I guess, once we've, and then so be kind of at, towards the, you know, the draft of the role of the CIP? What do you think? I think yeah, I think so. Sense. I do too. Okay. And then, I mean, ultimately, for budgeting for, was it FY16, I guess? W when would you want a completed CWMP? I mean, I guess, you know, I, I don't know if any of that actually has any relevance, actually like stamping it done, or if once you have the CIP and the numbers, that might be enough to work off of. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Okay. I'm just trying to yeah. get everything wrapped up here. Yep. We'll get for the next fiscal year. So just so you know, the, the capital plan this past year started in September. Yeah, yeah. I know it always starts a lot earlier than ever. Than ever this is the first year they've done that. Usually they work together with the budget, and our budget work usually starts in January each for each fiscal year. It seems to me we need, once, once we get this process finished, we need to go to the public and say, this is what's going on at the treatment plant and in the collection system. And boy, hold on. And your bill. <laughs> right, and, yeah. the and the consequences to the rates and and uh, a la the stormwater system. Maybe not the same format, but that kind of... I'd love to do 10 public meetings in every ward. Uh, and the chairman would too, I'm sure. Because <laughs> he's so good at it. Yeah, he's bored right now. And, uh, he must not have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, though. I mean, we really, really need to get the, the word out on what's happening here. Right. right. I mean, we've got a huge problem, and uh, we can't let it wait until we just decide to address the budget. Yeah, especially since nobody sees most of what we're talking about. It's either underground or hidden back behind. In the lowest corner of the right, and city. you guys are holding everything together with bailing wire and duct tape, and and uh, so people assume there's no problem. So currently, the mayor looks at a five-year capital plan, and this year, because we have cash stabilization funds uh, from the DOR that was recommended. If we're setting aside money away for projects, we have to list those projects in the capital plan, just so everyone's aware of that. So we're, if we are doing something, we're going to have to put out a minimum of a five-year plan and the costs associated when we're going to tackle those projects. So that will go to city council. Is, does that plan get renewed on an annual basis? It does. You're always it does. looking right. five years out. Mm -hmm. So I wonder when we bring this up to the that joint city council BPW committee. I mean, they should know pretty soon. I would say once put, this final this task nine is final, I think we can start that conversation rather than out of the draft report and some of the recommendations from 10 and past 10. Mm -hmm. I think they already know that we have looming costs coming. We've been talking about that for years. The budget rates have reflected that it was 9% for future projects and now we're able to define what they are going to be. Mm -hmm. Should be a good 10 minute agenda item. All right, well, thanks for the input. That helps. Definitely helps. Yeah, thank you, folks. <coughs> Meeting's over. Meeting's over. Thank you.